Hey guys, welcome to a special edition of the Super Media Brothers Podcast. I am Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okami. And we have with us once more Dollar Store Dev. Say hi, what's up, man? What's up? That's right. So, in case you guys have not heard on our social media this past week. Which I'm surprised if you haven't. Yeah. Um, we have done two episodes doing a review on Samurai Cop and Samurai Cop 2 Deadly Vengeance. Somehow, I don't know how the fuck. <laughs> he reached out to us. Yeah, Matthew Caritas the star of these movies reached out to us and was like, Hey, if you guys don't mind, I would like to come talk to y'all or call y'all and give you guys some insight on the making of and the drama that went down in these movies 30 and three years ago. It was like, what the fuck? How does this happen? When does it happen? You know, I'll throw you one better. Why does it happen? (laughs) It was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. Whenever I heard the news, I think it was for all three of us, honestly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, again, it was like, and this isn't like, you know, saying, oh, you know, anybody's better than anybody else or any of that shit. But it was like, it was one thing for for Greg Hatanaka to reach out and another for, you know, anybody anybody in general to reach out. But then it's like, Matt was just like, yeah, I heard you guys' episode and it cracked me up, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know, the fact that he was just like, we, we cracked him up with all the shit we picked out. I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. And then he was like, yeah, I want to call y'all and talk to you. It's like, uh, like I'm going to fucking say no. <laughs> why would you? Like, why would you say no? And right. and for that interview... You can't say no to no, Joe. No, you can't say fucking no. Say no to Joe one more time. Hi, Joe. <laughs> oh, hi, Joe. <laughs> oh, hi, Joe. <laughs> so, uh, for this interview, we brought Devin along with us because he has been a part of these two episodes and we were like, well, we can't fucking do this without him there. So he was the reason we got all this going. I know. He just fucking brought this movie to us one day. He was like, hey, you guys have to fucking watch this bullshit. I was like, okay. This is such an honor. It was so fun, though. It, it was. really was. Like, I, I watch these movies anyway and now I get to watch them with people and it actually goes somewhere. Like, I'm talking to an actual Where actor. Where do we go? To, to fame. Oh, to no, God, no. This, no. We're not. No. I have Let no. me live my dream. No, it's okay. It's not you, our dream. I work at a dollar store, okay? <laughs> Talking to an actor at all is a big deal. This, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like, uh, it was so much fun. We got to talk to him for a good, like, hour and 40 something minutes. So, what y'all find out in a little bit? Oh, yeah, he had a lot of great stories to tell and was very interesting to talk to. Very funny dude. Uh, really nice. Like, above all, extremely nice. Extremely very humble. humble, too. Yeah, very humble. So, without, uh, I guess, unless you guys have anything else to add. No. It was a blast. Yeah, fuck yeah, it was a blast. Yeah. <laughs> so, with both arms intact... <laughs> <laughs> without, We're lucky to go that far. Yeah, it'd be lucky, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so without any further ado, let's go ahead and quote slice and dice our way into this interview. We're keeping it warm for you. Yes, sir. We're keeping it warm and ready. Bingo. Like a hot and ready pizza. Fuck yeah. Also, hashtag banana. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Hashtag, hashtag K. Hashtag K. <laughs> without any further ado... We are about to roll the tape on the Super Media Bros featuring Dollar Store Dev interviewing the star. The one. The one. The only. The only. Samurai Cop, Joe Marshall. Matthew Caritas of Samurai Cop and Samurai Cop 2 Deadly Vengeance. Enjoy. They call him Samurai. He speaks fluent Japanese. Are you Fujiyama? What does Katana mean? It means Japanese sword. Yo, Polly. <laughs> What's up, Matt? How you doing? How, how you doing there, buddy? Hey, very good. <laughs> you got the Super Media Bros, man. 
That's right, man. Uh, happy Memorial Day. Oh, happy, happy Memorial, Memorial Day. Day. Same to you, That's sir. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so how you doing, buddy? Very good. Who do we have on the line with us today? All right, you got all, Rich- all three? Oh, yeah, you got all three of us, man. You got Richie right here. Devin. And Okami, a.k.a. Cody. Cody. Is that the guy that called me the aging banana? Is that, is that <laughs> there? Yeah, no, yeah, that just, was him. No, this no, is lovely <laughs> sir right here. <laughs> no, no, that was you. <laughs> Introduce yourself again one more time for the man. <laughs> hey, bud, uh, this is Dollar Store Dev. That one was me. No, right on. No, I'm just teasing. That's a very accurate description. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm so happy that you're doing okay with that because, good Lord, whenever I heard that we were doing this, I was like, I know this man about to roast me. I know. No, him. no. No, ever <laughs> since this, this whole stuff started, that's kind of in the beginning why I even, uh, my daughter forced me to come back from the dead because of all the comments, which I thought were hilarious because, you know, I get it. But yeah, I've I've always enjoyed that. I know the fans love the movie, but I love listening to all the <laughs> criti- criticisms and mockery. It's just it, it's funny. It really is. It's like a fun experience, I guess. You know, because oh, you, yeah. you go from doing something like that, and then you see it for what it is. You know, after all these years, you're like, oh my god! Like you, know, you would never expect it to come to this. You know? No, no way. I mean, I, I was laughing because my daughter, my oldest daughter's birthday is next week, and she she'll be the same age that I was when I filmed Samurai Cop. So that's why, to wow. me, wow. it's like a whole different lifetime ago, a whole different you know dude. So that's why I kind of look back and go, that guy is a tool. And I, <laughs> <laughs> not that the sequel was much better <laughs> at fifty years old, but you know, uh, you pulled it off though, man. Like we we actually really enjoy both of them. So and you know when. You were like, oh yeah, I heard the first, I heard the first podcast y'all did, and you know how he just kind of picked apart what you said was like all the batshit crazy stuff. It was like, right? There was a ton of it that was batshit crazy, man. Mm-hmm. Like, how did like so when when that all like happened? Like, how did you like how did you land that? Like, how did you first like meet Amir and like, you know all that stuff? I had come, uh, obviously, you know, just as a young actor, one of the big things back then in, in the late '80s, early '90s, was you had to get uh, videotape or something that you could show casting directors or producers that, you know, you're pretty good at what you do. Um, so I had a friend that worked with me with Stallone when we were bodyguards by the name of Voyo uh, Gorek, who was the big Russian guy, if you ever watch Rambo 2, that fights with Sly and throws him, you know, Sly eventually throws oh, him yeah, out of the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Voyo was a, was a very, very uh, dangerous street fighter from Europe, and he wanted to really come to America and put behind his criminal past. He was a pickpocket and this and that, had been in and out of probably every prison over in Europe. But um, he wanted to become an actor, and he had met this Amir Shervan and said, hey, you know, Matt, you need to go see this guy. He does these low-budget movies, and, you know, maybe he can get a little small part in it. I did, I think Boyo did maybe two days' work in one of Amir's films, and I still don't see him in any of them, so I don't know how that came about. But he said, just go see him and, and, and see if you can you can get some work with him. How was your first initial meeting with Amir, though, when you first met him uh, in person? It was, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen pictures of Amir. He was a very short, portly, you know, Iranian, very sweet guy. Um, and uh, I just went to his office, which was actually a home in the Silver Lake area here in, in L.A., just outside of, like, downtown L.A. And I just walked into his office, and, and he immediately just began, you know, stroking my ego with, oh, my God, you are perfect. This is exactly <laughs> what I'm looking for. And, you know, you are You are like the perfect so banana. <laughs> exactly. You will age gracefully like Chiquita Banana. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, you know, and I was just like, oh, great. This, this guy thinks I'm the bomb. That's great. And, and, and so, yeah, that was kind of how Amir always did it. He, he looked at people and he, he, even through his whole movie, every single character you see even in Samurai Cop, uh, was cast by Amir for a reason. They have a look, mm. and the looks sometimes don't match what he's supposed to be doing. Oh God! No. But so for in his mind, I think he was looking for a lethal weapon type uh, leading man, you know, black guy, white guy, and and I just happened to get lucky to to be that guy that day. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what the, that's kind of like what we kind of picked up on that when we watched it, because um, Devin is the guy that kind of showed us, you know, this movie, and that's yeah. what he said. He was like. This is kind of like lethal weapon, like you know, discount. light. Yeah, discount lethal weapon is what he pretty oh, much. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so low, low, low budget. <laughs> <laughs> so like, how? What was the budget like? Because that was a that was a thing that you brought up, Devin. Yeah. What? Well, how yeah. much did this cost? 
Yeah, there's a lot of rumors about. I, I've had since um, met with Amir's son, which was Ben Ben Shervon, who was probably I don't know, I'd say 15 or 16 when we filmed the movie, and he had told me that his dad only had spent like 30 grand for for that for that movie. Holy and, shit! And a lot of that money obviously went towards the 35 millimeter stock film. Um, but you know, he, um, Amir sold that thing, like, I think worldwide and he would make like $300,000 just there. back in the day, you know, you sold territories like Germany would say, Hey, we're looking for some American movies. And, and Amir would have a, you know, a stable of four or five little low budget movies that he made for really tiny budgets, but he gave European buyers what they wanted which was you know in my case he wanted a stallone clone or a look-alike he had the guns and the shooting and the nudity and that's kind of why they, they kind of jump at jump jump out at you when you watch the movie but it was purposely put there by amir because the gratuitous sex scenes and then the stupid language and, and so on and so forth was what was the marketing tool that he used to get his his movie sold so he made a great living you know doing these and i think he had five total that we know about um, Samurai Cop being probably the most, you know, prominent of all of them. Yeah. But oh. um, and I think even Robert Zadar was in a couple other films with Amir before yeah, before he, Samurai Cop. Yeah, he was. He was in Young Rebels and Killing American Style. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I've seen yeah. pieces of those. Yeah, dude. Like I actually just <laughs> checked those out uh, this past week, and it's funny because you, like you look at the way Amir had shot, you know, like he the same way he shot with Samurai Cop, thirty five millimeter, all that stuff, but then like. One thing we were kind of going to get into next was, like, that's kind of a consistent thing you notice with Amir is, like, all the voice dubbing and then, like, the, all the post-production shenanigans that, you know, tend to happen with some of those movies. <laughs> yeah, he was his only, he was the only guy there that was doing that. But I think if you have watched all of those films, I, I've seen bits and pieces, and the dialogue is pretty consistent i think amir wrote it or had a friend that would write for him but the phrase is like keep it warm i swear we're in another movie Dude, yeah they um, were in they were in killing american style like i literally it, just watched okay. that earlier. the very beginning of it yeah well yeah was it one of the rapey dudes or something yeah, I don't know. it was, <laughs> yeah, it was. There's, there's some real creepy characters in those other movies but yeah i started to notice there was a, a notice a lot of the same cadence and dialogue and you know, uh, I think Amir, like I've said in, in previous interviews, he grew up watching old westerns, so a lot of it was, hey, you, come here, hey, shoot, shoot him. You know, that kind of... John Just like the Wayne. car chase scene. Exactly, you know, and, and, and that car scene specifically, which I've talked before, he was sitting in the back seat, and, and uh, Peter Pallion, the, the cinematographer, was across from me, oh, and Amir would say, all right, Matt, say shoot, and I'd say, shoot! <laughs> say it again, and I'd say, shoot him! I had no idea they were going to be back-to-back. -back. <laughs> so you you know, thought I thought, I mean, it was just, and that's what we did, you know, a young actor, you're trusting the guy that's running the whole show, okay, I guess he knows what he's doing, so we'll do it, but it became pretty evident, as you guys have noticed, as filming went on, I started to go, this thing is going to be shit. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to start having some fun with it. But And then you obviously see days when I'm just like, I can't believe I'm sitting here giving a line to a lamp. <laughs> doing I gotta... it on scene. But I mean, so that's why I laugh when you guys had a lot of those observations. I go, see, they, they get it. But Dude, most no. people didn't know, and they just think this guy's an idiot, which is true. <laughs> and there was bad acting. I, I always want to have a disclaimer that I'm not trying to say... It was all a mirror, but there just came a point of, you know, over eight months where you're just like, oh, my God, I can't believe we're still doing this. And mm -hmm. I just wasn't giving my all. And that just comes from uh, immaturity as a, as a young actor. For sure. Like, wasn't the shoot supposed to last? What, like, um, like you, I think you said something like three weeks at one point, but it wasn't necessarily like a three weeks straight. It was just like you would shoot a couple of days and then kind of go off a little bit and then come back for a couple of days or. Yeah, it was supposed to be, I think he originally told me like four weeks, and it was, um, I think he had to acquire locations which were basically homes of friends, and there was probably seven or eight, you know, different locations um, that we shot at, and sometimes they weren't available, or they were, and, and um, but yeah, a lot of it was just stopping so Amir could go and develop the film and see what he had and then come back and pick up shots and, and it, I think it just kept going on and on like any independent filmmaker I just think it was lack of funding that ended up creating a lot of the hilarity with the you know continuity problems and this and that because you just aren't focused on that you just want to put a beginning middle and end together so you can get this thing to the film art and sell it so I don't think he was that 
particular as like you or I or, or most young filmmakers would say, let's just really do the best we can do now. And even Greg Hatanaka, God bless him, fell into that same with the sequel. But so, you know, I mean, his heart was in the right place, but it just it just didn't turn out. And I mean, it's magic in its own right, oh, I guess, what it is now. Oh, absolutely. Some form of magic, yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like as far as like creative control, like you, did, you, you brought something up, Cody, about like, you know, whether he had any kind of input. Yeah, so with both films as a whole, would they would sit there and tell you, okay, do this for me or act this out or do this dialogue. Did you kind of have like a way of going, okay, well, maybe I can influence it with putting this in there or did you kind of like step back and say, well, I'm going to just respect them for what they're doing or what kind of creativity did you bring when you came into the films, basically? With the first one with Amir, you, we learned very early on, I think the very first scene that I shot in that movie was the um, pool scene where Jennifer and I are swimming in the pool and I have the <laughs> bikini on. Um, that was day one. And um, after that scene was done, Amir said, okay, now we're going to go shoot the love scene with you and Melissa in the bedroom. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I just kind of think it's weird. Why, why would this guy be wanting, I mean, he's trying to, fall in love with this girl but now he's having sex with helicopter girl and, <laughs> and i knew melissa you know real well and, and and i just thought well this is stupid we didn't mind but i just thought it's kind of gratuitous and, and ridiculous now of course the girls are the ones that are always getting exposed i just have to walk around in a ridiculous banana hammock but <laughs> so uh, you know i'm kind of thinking ah, and and then mir really got loud and he's just like you will do as i say i'm going to film this and and i get it now because he he actually filmed that day all of the love scenes in that house. So Melissa and I did our love scene in one bedroom. Then Robert Zadar and the fish kish kissing scene with the, the redhead, and, you know, and they they were drinking wine at a time, you know. So it's kind of like Amir said, I got to get all the nudity stuff as soon as possible before these people say they don't want to do it or whatever, you know, the girls specifically. I know so, you got to get but, in the mood for so long, and one day is like you got to do it like all in one day, basically. I, I think so, and maybe we're all shell shocked. That's the same day Mark had his, you know, black gift scene, in the same <laughs> and that was the very first scene he did. So poor Mark's probably like, "What, what the fuck am I getting into?" This black <laughs> We've had discussions about it since, but so yeah, there was no creative control with Amir in the first one, and then obviously in the second one, Greg Atanaka was a little bit more gracious or i would say accommodating maybe with a documentary that of the filming comes out it'll be matt was more of a pain in the ass but yeah i i, I am a control freak even in my natural you know habitat of nine to five life and things that i do a very very calculated controlled and specific i really strive for excellence so i was thinking that oh with the sequel we'll be able to do that let me help out as much as possible and Greg did allow me, uh, you know, to do certain scenes, and we can get into that later, which ones those were. But between the two, I would say not so much in the first movie. You just showed up when when Amir called, and you you had to know your lines because, as you guys said, there there were really just one take um, scenes because a lot of this we were stealing scenes um, in certain locations, didn't have permits, and we had to hurry up before somebody called the cops. And you mm. know, oh, so it was like really guerrilla then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and how ballsy Amir was that opening shot in front of the Parker Center oh, in downtown L.A., LAPD, he, he, he just goes, just run up on the steps and come out from the corner and we will start filming. <laughs> well, Next thing you know, you, you know, see him taking a camera and throwing over the fence and hopping and going. <laughs> just, and you know, he was just, you know, set up on the sidewalk and then the cop that you see, there really was an LAPD cop coming down to his car and Amir <laughs> no. just schmoozed him and said, you know, oh, yes, we are second unit for Hunter, and we're filming just pickup scenes. Do you mind being in the... And, of course, the guy is, sure, yeah, no problem. And I'm thinking, this guy is, is just the magician of manipulating people <laughs> into That's the beauty of casting, I guess he has. Yeah, and, of course, the cop's <laughs> looking at me with this fucking wig shoved under this tiny hat. <laughs> like, what kind of fucking Hunter show is this? <laughs> So, you know what I mean? That's, I always dealt with that. Like, these people are just going, what the hell is going on? And, but you just go with it. At that point, it became a joke, Matt, with the possum under his head, uh, hat, you know. <laughs> so, but anyway, it was just it was just uh, nonsense. But, I mean, it's fun to look back at it. Like I said, that's why I love everybody having fun. And and if they know the, the history behind it, and, you know, that's, that's kind of like I talked about. It's a telephone game. Like, you guys had some things correct, some things were a little off. And then I always feel like, oh, they should know that it was this, that, and the other thing. But <laughs> sometimes I wonder if I do that 
um, too much. And that was one of my biggest things when I came back to life was to tell the story. Me now explaining to everybody the truth, would it take away from, you know, the magic of scenes that you watch now that you have a little bit of background? And it seems to not have done that. And I think people just enjoy really knowing, oh, okay, that makes sense. But they can still love it for the nonsense that it was when they first saw it, you know, not now knowing a little bit with the curtain pulled back of what was really going on. Oh, dude, if anything, I feel like it amplified the fun factor, you know? Yeah, I think to a degree, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, okay, so I have a question. Sure. Okay, so I have the Blu-ray to the original Samurai Cop, and throughout various interviews and articles that I've read, you were basically kind of poking fun at the movie, but in a, God, this is so stupid sort of way. And once I listened to the commentary of the original movie, you were poking fun at it kind of lightly and almost lightheartedly, almost as if you you were talking about a completely different experience. Was that because at that point you were older and you understood the audience in which the movie garnered more, or what, what was that? I, I think I've always tried to be just candid and honest about, um, like I said, I, I, I can look at it and obviously agree with everyone that it was just kind of flat you know, acting and, and me thinking at that age, 26, oh yeah, I got this shit down. Now, remember, I had come from, you know, working with Stallone for probably three years prior to that. And, and uh, when I first came to LA, wanting to be an actor. So now here you are on set, you know, Tango and Cash and Lock Up, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot and watching, you know, a big world renowned movie star and, and, starting to think, oh, yeah, I got this. I can do, you know, I can do what you do, you know. But not realizing that <laughs> you're a fucking out of your league, dude. I'm not trying to, to, to imitate him, but thinking, yeah, I can I can run up. Uh, I can be a leading man in, in a movie, no problem. But you really have to know your shit. And maybe the property, you know, the uh, Samurai Cop is a property and as a story, the lines weren't exceptional, so... It doesn't mean that I couldn't have done better, but I can look at it now and say, you know, it's just it, it's just funny for me to, to examine and, and be honest about how things went and how I was and, and, and to be able to laugh at it. And um, that was part of the motivation why Mark and I thought, well, yeah, let's do a sequel and show, show we're really better actors than we were. But I think you're really, as they say, only as good as the material. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I could have drifted through that with some better some better acting even though the dialogue was very specific and even like the lines of I know I'm telling you son of a bitches <laughs> um, we know, quote that say, all the time yeah which is funny but you can see where it's uh, mirrors English to you know, I mean Iranian to English translation and he didn't get it and I would say I go oh we wouldn't say that we'd say you sons of bitches and he said no I don't like that just say son of a bitches <laughs> So what are you going to do? And then that's kind of where you start to deteriorate and and um, you just kind of start not doing the best that you could do. But, um, you know, and that's, that's what kind of hurt me in the long run. There was really no footage that I could pull from that to show anybody like, oh, yeah, I'm a good actor. It's like, oh, this is all <laughs> crap. But And it was my own fault. But it's just um, it's, it's just fun to look back, I guess, and just laugh at it. Oh, absolutely. I would I would think it would be anyway. Um, oh yeah. <clears throat> so one one thing I wanted to know just because again, like you, you hear reports of like just exactly how, you know, I say pissed for lack of a better term, like how like irritated was Amir when he had found out that you had cut your hair off after filming had wrapped or, or whenever he told you guys that filming had wrapped and you had to come back. Um it, it, at that point, let's see, we started in June of 90 and and I think pretty much Every day at filming, I would bring something up. Like you guys had mentioned, the sliding glass door when Akamura is on the bed with his girlfriend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he he gives us direction. He says, "All right, before I need him to have time to get up and get dressed, so the door is jammed, okay?" And I said, "What kind of idiot cop would not? First of all, you don't hey freeze Akamura and start fucking around with the door." <laughs> So we're, we're seeing that and understanding that as actors before, but then we're just going to go ahead anyway and do something ridiculous. So that's where it's kind of a hard thing to, to continue every day showing up and doing work when you know this just isn't going to play right, but you got to listen to the direction, but then you know the end result is going to be ridiculous. So 
Uh, meaning that if I wanted to show this tape to another director, you know, a director or casting agent, they would look at it and go, what, what, what is that? And it's just so ridiculous. You're trying to open the door and you're giving your line, but it doesn't make sense. So it takes away from whatever you're trying to do. So every day that went on, and let's say we filmed, like I said, June to 90, and then we finished principal photography where Amir said we're done in November and of 90 and he said okay we're done that's it now obviously like you've heard i i went off and cut my hair shorter and went and got new headshots so when he called me back to his office in uh, january um i just walked in and he just flipped out like i and i was kind of like taken aback like what are you talking about you you fucked up my film (laughs) (laughs) and i'm thinking i fucked up your have you been watching footage But I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to be a dick, but I'm just like, what? And I, I kind of was like taken aback, but then I felt bad. And I'm like, well, you know, cause I wanted to, to help if there's really more to do, what else is there to film since we've already spent six months. So, you know, I was all for that. Now, I mean, literally we just jumped in his little tiny car and we drove just to over to Hollywood Boulevard, the, the wig shop. And I mean, it was that, and people think I'm exaggerating. It was literally no. And he just grabbed his keys. We went in his car off we went and he's mumbling in the wig shop and he's looking and he's throwing different wigs on my head and this is fine all right this will do all right let's go you know and <laughs> oh my but God. we had no hair and makeup girl so i'm sitting there i don't know am i supposed to iron the wig how do this doesn't look like my hair what the hell but yeah he was very very pissed off about that and so again i just you know giving respect just thought all right let me let me just give him what he wanted and i didn't know it was going to be another 2 3 weeks of what I thought were pickup shots from far away were up close fighting, you know, the, head, the things shit. falling off. And I'm like, this is just getting worse and worse <laughs> as we keep filming. But, you know, whatever, it's his movie and I don't think it'll ever be seen. So I'll just hopefully get a video copy from him and then I'll use that. And little but, did yeah, you he know. was very, very upset about, about the, the wig. <laughs> yeah, little did you know. <laughs> that is it a cult be. classic now. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. That's what I said. Unintentional magic you know happenstance that turns into be you know what it is now but uh, can you imagine if i would have taken that a uh, film or if it would have been released people would just go oh, what is this and left the theater i mean it's yeah. only over time and in that eclectic cult culture of people that love to pick apart and you know and then really find out what this movie is at its core that's fun but it was never intended to be that yeah and the release of this movie it never really got an actual <clears throat> theatrical release so did, what did Amir wind up doing with the finished product? I mean, did did he do like with his other films and, you know, sell it overseas or did it ever have a release overseas or anything like that? Yeah, yearly he would just go to the um, AFM, the American Film Art in Santa Monica at the Lowe's Hotel and that, and they would rent, you know, rooms and each film distributor would sell would sell their movies and, and um, you know, on the upper floors were, you know, Warner Brothers and Paramount and they were selling, I think actually maybe the year of or the year before Lethal Weapon was actually being sold. And of course, if you're selling that to a foreign territory, it's millions of dollars uh, for that. And then Amir would say, well, you know, if you can't afford that, come to my suite. I have something like that. And he would show them posters and pictures and and say, here's a lethal weapon, and but mine's only you know ten thousand dollars for your region and, and that kind of thing. So he only sold it um, in, in those kind of markets, and then never never in a you know theater in the U.S. was it was it shown. Just always bought and went straight to video and, and overseas territories. And then they, I assume, showed it in their cineplexes, you know, in Europe and, yeah. and everywhere else. So did he like sell it like in like a lemonade stand kind of setup or something? Because like, oh yeah, here's Lethal Weapon in this big booth, and it's like, oh no, we have better film, but at better budget, and this little yeah. like rack shack basically. I think the story was, and and Ben would tell me that there was security at every level to keep the little filmmakers away from the big studio, and Amir would bring bagels in for the security guards every morning and then that would allow him to pass past them get upstairs <laughs> and when the buyers would be mingling in the hallways he would pass out his card and he would say oh i'm down in suite such and such and then you know he would have his five or six movies that he, he had um put together and, and sell them but that's that's kind of it was like a swap meet but there was just different degrees and levels of of um you know distributors out there from like i said from warner brothers and sony and so on all the way down to the independence of amir's uh film company which i think was hollywood royal pictures was the name of his his distribution company yeah that's the thing that pops up at the very beginning of samurai cop is uh yeah. royal 
when did you see the first, well, I say first cut of the film, like when did you first see the movie like completed? I th- at the time coded copy he gave me in probably March of 91, I think he called me back to his office and then I got a copy of it and then I, I duplicated it and called Mark Fraser up and I said, hey, I finally got a copy and gave him. But that was, yeah, probably about then and I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. So knowing what you knew going through the filming process and actually sitting down and watching the movie like firsthand, what was your first reaction whenever you saw this? I just, you know, it was, it was, it was bad. And then I, I just thought, where can I find little scenes that I can edit out and use to put on a reel, which was, as I told you before, my main goal of, of trying to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know. I think I picked out certain scenes like, you know, when Mark and I come out from behind the car, when the grenade, Robert Zadar throws the grenade. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So there was kind of a cool, you know, 35 millimeter smoke as we come out. That's a nice visual. And then, of course, there's the racist dialogue of, you get your charcoal black right on, it is black. (laughs) So I think I took kind of that scene, and then I maybe edited a couple fight scenes with, with Gerald, which were, of course, ridiculous also. You know, they start off in the hot summer and they end up in the winter and then I got a wig on, you know, so it was like a seven month <laughs> continuity scene there. But I, I can't remember any other scenes that I think because I couldn't use the restaurant monologue. That thing was ridiculous, too, because as you saw, my performance there was just irritated in his office just speaking so, to a lamp. So dry. Yeah. <laughs> and I have yeah, to have a... You know, I mean, part of that was me thinking I was doing good acting, but I was also kind of pissed um, that um you know we're we're still why didn't we do it that day but again you know who cares it's not i shouldn't have been bitching about it but it was more or less you see that's bad acting obviously because all i was trying to do was remember the lines and i wasn't in the moment if we want to talk like it's inside the actor's studio with matthew Carita. <laughs> um and the main thing that i try to tell people when they ask about jill marshall the character his background i said there was no jill marshall it was me matt hannon at the time mm-hmm. <laughs> doing what he thought was good acting there's no character you know greg when we shot the sequel was more or less, you know, you got to kind of do the things that the fans loved in the first one. They're going to make your crazy eyes and growl. And I said, I don't want to fucking do that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the stupid shit acting. But I, I understood. And again, that's that compromise with Greg's vision. And he thought the fans kind of want this. But then he also allowed me in the second one to do some scenes that were a little bit more, you know, down to earth. And, and, and they kind of showed me doing something different but it uh, basically i'm only matthew caritas a reality personality if you want to classify it's not really an acting i don't still think i've done anything that's considered acting <laughs> but uh you know i was fun to do in the very first movie when you asked earlier what are some things that i was a- allowed to do when i when mark and i jump over that fence and i look for him to come over from the top and he comes under yes. the fence that whole thing i came up with for mark and i to do and so that's me showing a little bit of me who i really was which was comedic because as you guys know i did stand up comedy and that was what i was really comfortable doing so i got to be less stiff you know what does katana mean it means japanese sword, sword. You know, that, <laughs> it's just, I, everything that you see me do is very <laughs> stiff and and a lot of it was because amir wanted my voice lower and um he didn't have body mics, so we all had to yell kind of our lines to a boom mic, and it just doesn't come across as good acting. Uh, besides the fact that I was a bad actor, but those things <laughs> enhance. You know what I mean? If you're if you're yelling a, a very intimate line loudly, it's like what, what the fuck? Or, or if you're saying it with a cadence that's just very, you talk low, but well, I want you to talk here. I go, I don't speak that low. Just try it. Try to talk down here like Sly. Oh my God. Everything was always tried to be like Sly. And I don't know if it's because he knew I worked for Sly and Robert Zadar was in Tango and Cash, so he had this fixation on Stallone and this and that. But, you know, I just kind of go, I don't want to do what he, that's not me. I'm more of a comedic, happy-go-lucky, goofy, but that's not what he wanted me to do. That's not what he hired me to do. So it's just one of those things that you get stuck into having to to do. But, yeah, there was really nothing off that <laughs> that tape when I finally did see the final version that I could use to kind of show who I was. So I typically just pulled comedy routines and stand-up you know clips when i had it filmed when i was at the comedy store ice house that kind of thing i mean this reminds me after you said that you know the whole nurse scene when he's like talking to her and she's like do you want to fuck me and you're just like look you just look back and forth go bingo (laughs) which was you know that was his written dialogue i didn't come up with it oh no shit 
My yeah, God. He, wrote, he wrote Bingo. And so I just think that line in itself, when she's like, do you want to fuck me in that other scene um, that Melissa does with the cop when we get ready to go bust into the house? She goes, hey, preacher, we got nothing to do. Let's fuck. And I can't <laughs> believe that Melissa, and I know her, she, was, she just did it, you know, with no problem, even knowing this is ridiculous dialogue. So, but yeah, everything that's in there, um, I don't even know if Bingo was used in a previous film of, of Amir's too, but it's just, um, you just, you had to say the lines as he wrote them. There was no, there was no improvising. That so, was So what? Matt, I have to ask, have you been circumcised? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Clean cut, aesthetically perfected penis. Yes, but uh, yeah, people always ask me about that girl, and I wish we could have found her for the for the uh, the sequel. But I don't I don't remember what her name was or anything. And like I've said in other interviews, she was very in the audition when she tried out for that. I met her in the office of Mir's office, and he said, "You two go back in the room and practice, Matt, and then come back and let me see how she does." And she literally grabbed my dick, you know, back in the. <laughs> other room of them so i'm like i said came back out and i go oh she's perfect man. <laughs> this is great you know I mean, like an idiot, but, she doesn't fuck around but but even for the women to have to go through and i guess everybody was just trying to get footage you just say some of the dumbest things it was like you've likened it to a porno i mean a lot of that is very pornographic stupid dialogue and and um, we all kind of look like porno actors i shouldn't say all of us but i could have easily been a, just a goofy guy that you know, with Sarah saying stupid lines and doing grotesque, long-winded love scenes that were just... And those I was not happy doing either, but it was like he just... He loved those love scenes with the girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so you brought up that we that you all looked like porn stars. And that makes me wonder, okay, whenever you actually casted legitimate porn stars for the second movie, was that kind of an homage or did it just happen that way? That um, and I don't know if you guys have interviewed or talked with with um, Greg. I didn't know um, who Caden Cross was. He showed me a movie that she was in of his called Blue Dream, I believe, and she really is a great actress. I think she's a good actress. Oh, absolutely! Now, I knew nothing about her porn world or her adult entertainment industry. You know, work. I just thought side. she's very pretty and she's very natural and she's a really good actress. And then later I come to find out, you know, that he said, oh yeah, she's like Jenna Jameson and Lexi Bell. I didn't know anything of who she was. And <clears throat> so at the time when we shot the promotional pictures for the Kickstarter for the second movie, they all showed up and I didn't realize that Greg was hanging around with these kind of people. I, I'm not trying to be disparaging, but he was hanging around a lot of the adult industry. Uh, and I don't know, maybe because that's where he found Caden the first time for his other movie. But, um, so I originally, when I saw the first cut of the second movie, didn't like the gratuitous nudity. I thought this is ridiculous. This isn't what I signed up for. And I said, here we go again. Um, this isn't what I think the fans wanted. I thought we were going a different direction. I mean, that's a whole other thing we could get into, but, um, yeah, to have the, uh, the porn people, I think that kind of hurt. It, it really hurt Greg, obviously, and I don't know if he's talked about it with Amazon. Uh, that's why Samurai Cop 2 got pulled off of um, because they started really controlling the content of what movies that they would allow on Amazon, and they felt that had too much nudity. So the first thing that Greg did was, and I don't know if you ever saw the edits where he put glowing orbs over all the boobs. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah. that was his first solution. Well, let me try this, and maybe they won't pull it down. Then eventually they said, no, screw it, and they pulled it down completely. Oh, wow. Then he, then he re-released uh, it under the uh, Revenge of the Samurai by also editing down more nudity and adding more Tommy Wiseau to capitalize on his popularity with the uh, film that he had that came out with James Franco. So there's been a lot of, so that's what I'm saying. I wonder what versions people are seeing if they get the Blu-ray. Now I think he's down to limited versions. That, that'll that be gone pretty soon. But I, I just, you know, I had no problem with the girls that were in the adult industry and working on the movie. I didn't care. It kind of adds to the, um, it's kind of the acid trip of Greg's second movie. You know, there's a lot of colors and there's a lot of, I think over time, eventually that movie will have its own place too. But I think it was trying, it was in that certain, Coming up as a sequel, people had a lot of expectations of what it mm -hmm. should have been. I don't think it hit that mark, but um, 
but yeah, I, I think in the first movie, the only porno or adult industry girl was the redhead. I, I believe either she was a dancer or she was in the entertainment, uh, the adult entertainment industry, the redhead. I think her name's Cameron something, but she went on to do some legitimate work. I heard on like Star Trek, Next Generation. Oh, wow. Okay. I guess she was a major, and I think Greg tried to reach out to her for the sequel, but I don't know too much about, like I said, I didn't have that many scenes with her. Mark Fraser spent a lot of time talking to her and, and knew something about her either as a dancer or in adult industry, but he didn't want to tell me, you know, anything about it. But, um, all the other girls in the movie, obviously Janice Farley was an actress. Uh, she was a model with Wilhelmina. So she was a very, uh, and I felt she was a good actress. I, I'm not trying to say everybody in the movie was bad. I thought she did a great job, but when we approached her for the sequel, she just um, didn't want anything to do with it. She's moved on. Her name has completely changed. Um, she, at the time, actually was married to a guy that owned a karate studio and thought, this is the last thing that I want to have come out <laughs> when people you know, find me, so please respect my privacy and, and, and you know, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with it. And I've talked to her since, and, and, and great, great girl, and she's still just as stunningly beautiful as she was back then. Um, but she's just kind of moved on. But... Um, yeah, I just think that was part of Amir's casting. He wanted the Melissa's with the breasts, and uh, he was trying to market that, like I said, for overseas distribution. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> sadly, I say sadly, but like that's kind of what sells over there, you know? It's kind of what sells there. But um, you had mentioned, you know, the stand-up comedy. Like we, we all three have, you know, knew that you did stand-up comedy. So, like, between Samurai Cop and then Deadly Vengeance, like, what did you do, like, between the movies? Like, you know, how did this, how did the uh, stand-up comedy stuff, you know, come about with the Brian it, Machiavelli it, stuff? Yeah, um, it, it started when I worked with Sly. I met a lot of people, like Sam Kinison used to come around and hang around Sly and Dice Clay, Andrew Dice Clay. So after I filmed um, Samurai Cop and then tried to get into other movies, I just really saw that the business out here is, it really is who you know. And the second thing is, um, <clears throat> I, I, I didn't want to change who I was comfortable as me being. Uh, I, I think I would rather have gone out to auditions and just, um, um, got hired for some character that was really close to who I was. And there's really wasn't a lot of parts for the guys with the long hair. I mean, there were guys in that time that had long hair and great builds. Joe Lara was one that I referenced. The guy from American Gladiators named Darren something, he was Malibu on that TV show. So I would start to see these same people always at the same auditions, and it's like, is this really what it's about? Oh, I need a long-haired, well-built guy. And you just go out, and you drive all over town. I just thought, this is fucking retarded. I, I can't, <laughs> this isn't what I want to do, and I can't, I don't think I can get into business doing the front door, which is audition, come in from the front, and let another person decide whether or not you're good enough to get to the next step, to the next step, and then to a producer, and then maybe get the part. So what stand-up comedy allowed me to do was to um, be myself um, and to create and and have complete control of the content of the comedy. I was always a class clown from, from my childhood, so for me to go up on stage, I enjoyed, and I, I hate to use the word as uh, I was a comic because it's kind of rude to those that really were comics. I basically liked to go put a routine together, whether it was three minutes, five minutes, go up and perform it, and then that was it. I would never repeat it. Now, that's what comics do. You know, Jerry Seinfeld, all these guys that are true professionals, you go and you redo it, redo it, you work on it, you work on it, and then I guess, I don't know, when the, when the peak is, you know, that we, oh, that was the best. Um, so I kind of wasn't in that little clique of comedians because, and I don't know if they felt I was standoffish or aloof because I, I didn't like going in every week to the comedy store and seeing the same comic doing the same routine for a different audience member. I like to just go up every time I went up. It was good even for the comics in the back of the room. Plus it was good enough for me. And I just felt as long as you keep going up on stage and doing something that's, that's worth the audience enjoys that's where i felt the power in this business is if you can get to the audience they're the ones that eventually will decide whether or not you can have a career which is ironically what has happened now in our generation with youtube and you know you'll see guys that come become internet successes and then they become popular after that because the money people say oh this guy's really you know justin bieber or whoever hey this guy's really good he's got a following let's get him mm -hmm. so it was a reverse um so 
for me to just be able to go do that. And Andrew Dice Clay, like I said, I met him through Sly, very good friends. And he would allow me, because he was, you know, pretty big shot, obviously, in the comedy world. If I would go down to the comedy store, uh, let's say on open mic nights, it's a it's it's a uh, hierarchy. Uh, oh, here, who's this guy? Oh, uh, we don't see guys like him. Uh, give him a four o'clock, you know, stage time, and it's like, dude, I'm not gonna fucking come down here at four a.m. for one person. You know, my theory was let me go on at nine o'clock with a three hundred seat room, and either I hit a double or a triple or a home run, and then I can come back. If I fucking strike out, I get it. I don't have to come back, but don't. I don't want to go through the bullshit. So that kind of attitude is very abrasive. I would yell at the, the, the doorman because they talk down to these young comics, and I felt, you know, fuck you, dude. You're you're trying to get into business too. Yeah. So anyway, what Dice allowed me was when I would go with him to the comedy store, and he was going on stage at nine. We'd be sitting in the back in the kitchen, and the, the host would come out and, oh, hey, Dice, how are you? I'm good. This is my friend Matt. Oh, hi, Matt. Can I get you something to drink? It's like, oh, now you're my buddy. <laughs> Last week I was a fucking tool go on at four in the morning, you know, so I didn't like that kind of shit. But anyway, so Dice would say, you know, Matt's going to go on before me, he'll open and then he'll introduce, okay, no problem. So I would go out in front of that pack crowd and I would do extremely well and get it, you know, great response. And that's all I asked for. And I just wanted to be able to do that weekly, but it's just the political climate and you, you can't do it. So that's kind of what I did on and off, um, slowly burned out doing that and then i just you know had my daughters and just started working nine to five and of course had the darker years which i don't know if you guys have gone into interviews and heard that story but um you know just went down a different path for a little bit gave up the acting because i just said it's just bullshit and i don't want to play the game and and um you know then all of a sudden at age 50 here comes the, the uh, <laughs> here boom, comes boomerang of samurai cop and then uh, <laughs> yeah one thing leads to another and then there you are right back in having fun with it but I, I just think now i passed that prime where nobody wants to see the aging banana on screen <laughs> <laughs> so you know i mean even though i know tom cruise and all those guys are about my same age but you know they've got 30 years of film work under their belt and so for me you know i, I like i said i'll enjoy any opportunity that ever comes uh if it does you know that's great but i don't actively go out and look for it and i've said before that uh, one of the amazing stories to me was that one of the biggest fans of samurai cop was quentin tarantino oh, had wow. seen the movie and, and when i was in uh spain for a film festival for samurai cop the producer that i met with said i found out about your movie from quentin tarantino we were having lunch at the chateau marmont and he goes you've got to see this movie this fucking movie is incredible it's samurai cop this fucking movie is great you know <laughs> so here's a guy that you know obviously super powerful so someday i'm thinking oh you know put me in a little cameo in your movie greatly appreciated you know you just never know when those opportunities could come up and then where they could lead to so obviously when greg came with the sequel that was an opportunity that opened up and and, and i had i've had fun doing that but you know i just kind of think uh, I gave it up, and even back then, like you asked, I, I just didn't want to play the game, I guess, in Hollywood, and I just thought, nah, I, I just want to do it my way, or I don't really care. Of course. And um, how did you get connected with Greg? I, I've spoken to Greg um, here and there on you know, on Facebook and stuff. It's super, super sweet guy. Like, How did how did you come into contact with him? Was it when he found the uh, 35 millimeter and had him restored? Is this before everybody knew that you had actually not died? You know, was can you go into a little bit about that? Or Yeah, he um, he's never done a verbal interview with you guys, or has he just talked on Facebook? No, I just been, I yeah, just been messaged back and forth. I just wish he would do more because, like I said, he's got so much to talk about. Oh, but, dude, yeah, I, I've asked him to come on the show like already, so he's, yeah, I think that might happen in, in the near future, actually. Yeah, I just think he's, he's, he's a plethora of information in, in the movie industry, and especially in that, that, that he was a film distributor, but I think... He found me, I actually, when I had, um, like I said, periodically in 2012, 2013, I would Google Samurai Cop every once in a while and read the <laughs> IMDB comments just for the hell of it. <laughs> and uh, somebody, I had said something like, because they would say something like, um, I wonder what this was about or what that scene was about. And I'd say, hey, it's me, I, we did this because of that. And they're like, yeah, right, you're not him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just take a picture with a newspaper, this and that. And I would just laugh and ignore it, and you know, a year or so would go by. But I did post, I think I tried to reach out to Greg in 2013 when the Samurai Cop reissue that Greg did, he remastered it. And I thought I saw something about Cinema Epoch, and, and I know that he interviewed, I think it was Robert Zadar and maybe, maybe Peter Pallion, I don't know. 
And I said, hey, if you ever want to talk, I, you know, was in the movie and never heard anything from him. He said, I swear I never saw that email. <laughs> oh, shit. Wow. But when I posted, when my daughter said, you know, Dad, when I read these IMDb, you should do something. Just put a quick little video up and let people know that, that you're not dead because apparently there's a guy out there named Matt Hannon that they think was you and he really did die and he was about your age but there's no photo attached but they really think that you're dead and you should let them know that you're not because i think they would enjoy hearing about you know what went on during the film and the movie and i kept putting it off and you know because i just do my job and i go to work every i don't, I don't care and i thought so one day as you all know i put up my camera in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i just was doing a little test thing which i used to do with her with my comedy routines and i basically say hey, you know, it's me, Samurai Cop, I'm 50 now, I guess if anybody ever wants to do a sequel, I'm, I'm ready. So I sent it to her and said, is this kind of what you want me to do, something like this? And I didn't realize she would actually upload that. Oh, shit. <laughs> the age you know, of YouTube. Th because, you know, again, not, not helping me getting out of that tool category. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, and, I, you know, whatever. I mean, when you look back, I guess it was funny. But anyway, it just went viral for some reason. I don't know what communities or cult started and it just started trending and then it just got bigger and bigger and like i said my iphone was going off because the email she had on my youtube was attached to it and there's like five six hundred emails coming from all over the world oh my god you're alive and so that was interesting and then greg i think was one of those people that said hey my name is greg hatanaka and i did the screening actually a year ago and mark fraser came out i would love to meet you because we want to shoot a sequel to samurai cop and I just thought, you know, who the fuck wants to see a sequel to... <laughs> but uh, I met with him in, in Calabasas. He came out to my place, and we went and had lunch nearby. And my only thing then was I really want to do this for the fans, and I want it to be a kind of a buddy cop, and if Mark's up for it, you know, no problem. And I didn't know that Greg had already met with Mark a year earlier when they screened the movie in L.A., um, and Mark had told Greg, you know, I'd love to make a sequel to this. I'm pretty well off now. I've got some investments and i'd like to invest you know a quarter million dollars i have no problem we'll do a thing where you hire a girl and she'll be the son of joe or the daughter of joe marshall and together we'll find out who killed the samurai cop that was the premise but it was kind of floating around out there as greg waited for mark's quote investments to come in and then they would talk a little bit more serious well then i come back to life in 20 or 2014 so greg and i met and then he said yeah i'd love to do the sequel and then um that that kind of gets into the that that story for Samurai Cop too, which we could get into. But that's that's kind of how we came um, to to hook up together was um, just him basically reaching out after he saw that 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 you know internet frenzy going on about the Samurai Cop's really still alive and he looks except for the banana still <laughs> the same. he's got you know because and I get that and I think that's what appealed to a lot of the fans to see the sequel was that Mark hadn't aged that much and I've said before black don't crack <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I love that you just said banana and then appeal so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah banana appeal <laughs> but I think for me at 50 typically guys my age have look like they're in their third trimester of pregnancy they have their hair <laughs> gone they kind of let themselves go you know richie um so Fuck i you. think for people to see <laughs> oh my god he still fucking looks like he's in the 80s you know so that worked where i think people thought man he's kind of similar as he was he's still got the hair maybe this would be interesting to see him and mark together again 30 years later and that was why we thought it would be fun and then we thought greg had a good idea you know which the original script we saw was nothing what you saw in the second movie but so that's just kind of how it snowballed and started but um just it's just a, you know a series of events odd events that just lined up and things worked out so what was the initial script idea once you came on board once greg had found out you know oh this guy's not bullshitting you know like what was the initial idea once you got involved for the well, when I when I sat down with him for that lunch, he kind of pitched me the idea. I had an idea. I really wanted to, and I think I've spoken before about it. I wanted to do kind of a Starsky and Hutch version of the Samurai Cop sequel, where it was more farcical. Of you know, it was Joe Marshall in present day, still either with those eighty eighties. Um, you know, whether it's short shorts, you know, out in Malibu, you know, I'm wearing a bikini, which no one does, you know, everybody wears board shorts, something that would be, it was supposed to be more fun and, and, and goofy of Mark and I, and Greg was more wanting to make this noble samurai cop, um, 
you know, a traditional back towards the Japanese lore uh, action movie. And again, the script that he had originally presented financially was probably a four to five million dollar script. And um, I think as we started to get going, and, and I don't know if Greg had talked about it with you guys, but the budget just wasn't going to be there. He thought he had because Mark Frazier had represented that he had money and um, Mark kept saying, Oh, I'll have my money on this date. And then that date would pass. So Greg would say, oh, okay, well let's postpone shooting because Mark's investment. I started to think something was up and wasn't really making sense. And I approached Mark and we had some dialogue and I said, dude, what, what is it? You know, what's this investment coming from? Can you be specific? And he was very vague and didn't want to talk about it. And I thought, something's up here. And I said, I, I told Greg, I, I, I think you cannot expect money from Mark. Something's up because I should be able to tell you, oh, I'm involved in a hedge fund and it's this or it's, uh, you know, oil mining, something, a tangible, logical reason for this plethora of windfall that Greg, I mean, Mark kept representing he'd have. So, and even to this day, it still hasn't come. And that's a whole other story. But I just said, you know, Mark, you can't keep leading Greg down this road. We got to get this done. The fans are expecting it. And that's kind of where Greg did that Kickstarter. He thought, let's just raise a little bit of money for special effects and little things here and there in the end because he thought he was still going to have a pretty big budget. I don't think the, the budget... It was very hard. I, Greg never was specific, but um, I, I, somebody rumored it around a million. I just don't know where it was spent. But, <laughs> you know, because I, I wasn't there saying, oh, I want X amount, give me a ton of money. Yeah. Um, you know... Um, I would rather have it gone towards the film, but um, I don't know. I mean, there's so many avenues to go down, and that's why I hope Greg's documentary somewhat talks about it. But uh, um, I hope so too, because like like you were talking about the the budget, man. Like I remember reading like initial reports that it was like between one and one point five, and I was just like. You know, and that was still under the impression that it was mostly financed by the Kickstarter and Indiegogo backers, and I was like, "There's no fucking way!" Like, that's yeah. a, that's a lot of fucking money, you know? Yeah, I think the Kickstarter raised maybe seventy k, and then I think you have to give a percentage back to the Kickstarter, and then so I think he only had like sixty, and then I I I, I want to say he added maybe another two. I just don't know. I know every soundstage that we shot on and anybody that was involved either did it for the love of the movie and they're like, oh, I would just, I'll, you know, I'm normally a grip on Warner Brothers, but I'll come do this with you because I just want to be a part of it. And and we shot it kind of in the down season here in town in December. But I, I don't think the budget was that much and that's why I wanted Greg to be a little bit more forthright because then people can see Again, I give kudos to him, and I'm very appreciative that he even attempted to make a sequel in this climate. You know, he's a fan, number one, and then to start throwing your own money in and mortgaging your house just to finish it, where most people probably would be like, we're out of money, we're done. Oh, yeah. Greg just did, he didn't do that, and for, for him to come from Matt's Alive, let me present a couple drafts, one, two, three, now let's do principal photography, a couple months later, let's do some reshoots, Next thing you know, it's in the theater within a year. It's, it's kind of unheard of, and it's, it's an amazing thing to do, and that's why I wanted Greg to touch base on that in the documentary. Hopefully that's his point of view, but I know, I know he doesn't want to be, you know, he wants trying to be humble. But then, you know, it puts into perspective when you start seeing nonsense in the second movie that you're like, what? why would he do this, or why did they film on a sound stage of a spaceship? What is that about? <laughs> Because the script actually changed four times from the time that I first showed up, uh, mainly because of, and Greg will speak probably more to that, um, you know, we didn't know if Caden would come every day because she was getting pissed off. Tommy Wiseau, we had no idea if this guy was going to show up or not. Oh my God. So there was just different characters that were written and, and Bai Ling was getting to be a little bit more difficult thinking that this was the crow or a major studio picture and it's like no we don't have all the accommodations <laughs> <laughs> so that starts to put it greg saying well you know i don't know if we can film that let's change it now you're this or now we're that and like the katana were from space originally and then i'm like what the fuck are we doing <laughs> <laughs> i don't get it why are we i go can we please greg please can we just film one set or one scene where mark and i leave this soundstage 
and we go, what kind of bad guys, you know, have their hangout in an old abandoned movie set of a spaceship? You know, I said, <laughs> do something that gives the audience a, oh, okay, now that makes sense. I go, otherwise, you're like, why the fuck are they on a spaceship? I know you call it the complex, but they're going to recognize it from Battlestar Galactica, 1980. <laughs> you know, so I start, I am too logical and too a type personality to be involved in filmmaking unless I have complete control. So I, I imagine I drove Greg nuts but i just thought this isn't gonna make sense the fans are gonna go what the fuck is you know <laughs> and you can't do that if you're an actor which is what i was i know i was a producer on it but it was greg's baby and you really have to let him do whatever he wants to do and trust him and i just have a hard time doing that and i i just was very critical and you know that's why i said for the third one i am taking complete control i don't want to have Anybody, you know, if we're going to do that, we're going to do it my way. I really think I know how to do it, just like I know my stand-up. I know what I think the audience would like, but that's a whole other story, too. But sure. you just got to really release to somebody the control. And I still feel, for whatever Greg did end up doing with the second one, it is an amazing achievement to be able to, to, to do what he did, to get it out there, to get it distributed, to have Blu-rays, to have, you know, this, that. All the Kickstarters got, whatever they said that they were going to get, signed posters, this, that. There's a lot of stuff that goes behind that. And I, I just have a lot of praise for people to do that and make films. And you don't make any money back. Greg's still in the the red. Mm. It, I don't know if he'll ever get it back. And it's, that's what bothers me the most is that here's a guy that had passion and fun, allowed Mark and I to come in to this world. You know, I've traveled to Europe and London and so on because of Greg. But yet, here's a guy that's maybe still trying to pay back loans, you know, because there's no money. The thing gets pirated, you know. You know, it gets. It's just a weird business to be in, and that's why it's 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 a it's something that, like I just said, I feel bad for, for Greg. And hopefully, someday he does break even. I know the movie screens here and there every once in a while, and people pay him for it, but it's just not to the degree that you think you know a movie should make money. Yeah, and I hope it does recoup because you know, like you said, you know, like we've said before, you know. Greg does definitely does deserve all the praise in the world for yeah. accomplishing a finished product at the end of the day because of all the shit that apparently had gone on, you know, all the drama he was talking about that went on, you know, behind the scenes and all this other shit like that. And it's just, you don't, people from the outside don't really think about that when they see a finished product. They're like, oh, they, they like, you know, made this, you know, shitty movie to a shitty sequel. And it's like, no, that don't, I don't think that was you guys' intention at all to come along and like purposely make a quote unquote bad movie because I know uh, just in speaking with Greg, he, you know, didn't intend for that at all. Like he was saying, you know, I don't, you know, want people to think I purposely went out there to make a terrible film and all this other stuff like that, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I think it was, again, the same circumstances that affected Amir um, because of lack of funding, the same thing with Greg and what happens is you start to compromise that artistic integrity and you understand this scene is not going to match the soundstage that we are on, but I got to do it because I have to make the story link up. Mm -hmm. So you start to, that's where, you know, as a filmmaker, I know that destroyed Greg because it's like, fuck, man, I, this isn't what I want to do, but I can't let the fans down, Matt down, Mark down. So there's a lot of pressure that goes there. And that's why I said that's why I, it's hard for him to, I think, make a documentary I, and I keep telling him, you know, you need to allow me to come in and speak from my point of view, because if you say it, yeah, you're, it sounds like you're giving excuses as to why it ended up this way, that way. But again, it's lightning in a bottle, a different way, not the same as the first movie, but it was not intentional. And that's where, and I think um, there's many filmmakers out there that have movies that come out that aren't what they wanted, but this movie is such under scrutiny, like, oh, are they going to be self-aware? Are they going to try to, now Greg did, put little things here and there for the fans, but it, we didn't want it to purposely come across as it did, which was Greg shot four, five movies. Like I said, he pulled from five different script ideas, but when it comes time to edit and pull it all together, none of it makes sense. So no. that's where I had to kind of, when we did reshoots, I had to say, Greg, you have to let me have a scene with Mark. Um, I'll just write it that I wrote was where after the ninjas ambush Mark and I at my place and then I say you know um, when I came up with this stupid line of you know Mark says you can rain down your deadly vengeance I said what needs to take place here is if the audience finds Joe secluded remote you know out living alone he's not just going to jump back into cop mode there has to be a reason so we need a scene between Mark 
and Matt or Frank and Joe that explains what's kind of been going on, why they've been apart. And the reason was because of the murder of Joe's wife. Mm-hmm. He wanted certain access to internal affairs that Mark being the by the book brother and all those lines I wrote, all that whole dialogue scene I wrote, because I know Mark likes cliche words. <laughs> um, I said, we have to have that moment, that, that, that character between the two guys now I'm doing the inside the actor studio. <laughs> uh, the bonding where, you know, he says to him, you know, um, you know, I came to you, you didn't help me. You, you were by the brother. Now all of a sudden you want my help. And, he says, come on, man, you need to come back, and together we'll find the killer, and you can raise That gave the motivation to Joe to say, all right, that's motivating enough to me. If I can find out who really killed my wife, then I will come back, because it's the love, that, that thing with Joe, whatever storyline that Greg wanted. You know, that, that, that works. And so we just shot that real quick in a reshoot in the corner of a, a warehouse, because it kind of matched up. I said, just light this. This brick wall looks like it would match, and let's do that there. <laughs> but that's the kind of piecing together stuff you do. The scene on the on the airplane was never in any script. It just happened to be a set next to a set we were working on. And Greg goes, "Hey, this is kind of cool. We should do a scene on the airplane." And dude, that what? scene was so fucking wild. I know, and it just was like, "What?" And poor Joselito came to the set that day with dialogue for a whole other set, an idea. And then we said, "No, we're going to do. You're a steward now." And he's, "What? I'm going to do what?" <laughs> 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 on the plane and you're gonna now you know uh, he's a very religious man i think he was a preacher so i have to be careful with him but he he's not you know a seasoned actor either and i'm literally line feeding him his lines and again that's me crossing boundaries that's greg's world that but that's me being the control freak sitting there working with Joselito. and i don't know if they'll have some of those outtakes in the making of the movie but um, you know, that, that scene was just done as Greg wanted it. Now, I don't know if you guys know, the guy that says no balls on plane, that's Greg. Yeah, that's Greg, yeah. yeah. So that's his little Hitchcock thing where he does his little cameos. <laughs> yeah. But I said at the end, I go, how the fuck are we going to be on a plane that blows up and then we're all fine? I said, please, Greg, please just let me do one voiceover. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're a little delayed here on the tarmac. We're going to be passing refreshments through. Please sit back and relax. We'll be on our way pretty soon. That allows the audience to know, okay, they're not in the air. But we can still add the scene on the plane. You see how I'm being a little too analytical? Yeah. And I said, Greg, please, they're going to go, who the fuck is on a plane that blows up? They'd be dead. We and where said are they that jumping, too. Where are they jumping off? Bai Ling and his crew go off the back curtain and they do what? So in one of the outtakes, you see me as we walk off. Mark steps down off the stage. Caden goes down the stairs off the stage. I actually jump and everyone laughs because it's like, are we not in the air or are we in the air? So, <laughs> Well, I mean, I just, you... You go trying from, to make fun of it. Yeah, because you go from like, okay, there's like peace and quiet. By Link and her girls come in, blow up <laughs> shit everywhere, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh god damn, we need to go to the station. Next thing you know, back in Los Angeles, like, what the fuck happened here? <laughs> right, and that's where you know that's why I said things don't make sense, but that's the rabbit hole we start <laughs> to go down again. <laughs> And then we're thinking, ah, oh, man, the audience isn't going to get this, and they're going to think we're just doing this on purpose to be. And we really weren't. But like I said, Greg just felt, you know, we've got a thing here. Let's let's use the plane. Let's let's just light it and let's do a scene here on the plane. And we'll, you know, and we came up with all that stuff. And I don't know if any of it made sense, but you know, we're just slowly throwing scenes together, like me and the naked chicks, butt naked chicks in the samurai outfit. <laughs> oh my god, that was like a beautiful scene. I'm just like, I show up and Greg's got this 100-piece suit sitting on the ground, and I'm like, Jesus. I have no fucking idea how to put this on. <laughs> and luckily, one of the stunt guys there goes, I know how, and he literally starts dressing me. It took what? about an hour. <laughs> but everyone else is out on the main stage with these naked... And adult entertainment girls that are sword fighting, full bush, everything. <laughs> and the snow. I don't know this is going on. No, it's just a green screen. I know, but it's just funny that they're all oh, naked yeah. in the snow. It's like, what? Later, <laughs> yeah, I think he added the snow. So I come walking out. I've got two chicks, bush, all that. I think they had to put a Birkin on them because they were shaved. Oh, I don't know what was going God. on. But I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing, man? I cannot believe 30 years later I'm in the same situation of... <laughs> This is not something I would have signed up, but I can't be the prima donna. I am leaving. I'm not going to do this. So I start. He goes, okay, just start moving around and yelling and screaming. Give me your eyes and go, ah. And I'm just like, <laughs> so you're again trusting. I guess Greg knows what he's doing here. But so, you know, this is just the oddity of how that thing just paralleled the first movie. And again, I'm grateful 
thankful, but at the time, I'm like, man, this is just not really what I wanted to be doing as a sequel. But I think you guys get it, and the fans that have seen it, I guess, oh, get it. We do. We definitely do. We love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What was it like working with Tommy? Like, how was, how was that, man? Because, like, you know, I know I know that guy is on a planet of his own fucking, you know, <laughs> world or whatever. But, like, how was it, like, working with him? What was he like on set? He was, I mean, I didn't, like I said, know anything about him. Greg said, hey, we're going to go have dinner and meet this guy, Tommy Wiseau. He's known for another famous cult movie called The Room. Have you seen it? And I said, no, I don't know anything about it. And it's just funny to me, um, you know, I get it, what I am, as far as in that lexicon of cult i get it he doesn't i think he (laughs) tommy really does believe that he is you know good at what he does i always try to be calculated in how i speak here i mean i admire what he has achieved and uh, again even why the movie was made about him you know the guy took his own money and and you know did what he did but there is that there's something about him and I just, I couldn't figure him out. And I think he was a little, he doesn't like to share this, the, uh, the, the spotlight. So I think he was a little taken aback. I think even in the first meeting with Greg and I, he just said, I'll do the movie, but I have to kill the samurai. I have to be the hero. <laughs> what? And, we're, and we're just kind of like, uh, okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, at the time, Greg's like, just say whatever you want, just so he'll do the movie. And I'm like, sure, whatever. I'll die. Yeah. You can kill me. <laughs> But it's just like, you know what I mean? So you're not really dealing with somebody who's a a rational thought process. So you just have to think of him as an autistic savant and just kind of go along (laughs) along with, you know, um, the fight scenes that I had to do with him were dangerous because we did actually have in some close-ups live, you know, samurai swords that were donated. So I had stunt coordinators just out of frame ready to block his, Tommy, you're supposed to go left, not right, and then chop my arm off, you know, that kind of thing. You would want to wind up like Lucky in the first one. <laughs> exactly. So, but it was just fun to have him show up, and, and he didn't know his lines, and it was very hard. And I just told Greg, Greg, we have to just feed him his lines. Just have somebody feed him the line, have him repeat it, and we'll just edit out your voice in post-production. It's very simple, but we can't sit here all day. And, and granted, Tommy was given some crazy lines. I can't even remember lines either. But I just thought, there's no way he's going to do this, so just feed him the line and let him repeat it. And that's what his assistant did throughout the whole uh and i think that'll be in the documentary and there's nothing wrong with that i mean it, it's getting what we needed to get done on a quick time frame without a lot of bullshit and then let tommy be tommy and greg knew what he wanted from tommy and it's priceless i mean the footage that he has of tommy you know it's there was nothing since since the room yeah and it's just it's if people that love tommy you're gonna see tommy now i know eventually he wasn't happy with the final cut you know i know you guys know we edited the trailer stutter that he had of you know um he stuttered in the trailer of the original movie uh, the second movie coming out and then he told greg you you remove that stutter or i will tell all theaters around the world not to play your movie anywhere and he has that kind of power in london so i get it but that's kind of what rubs me the wrong way about a guy like that i'm just like come on dude you you got to know you know, kudos where you're at, but you got to be a little bit more humble. And he really isn't. I think he doesn't get it. I've seen him in his, you know, personal appearances, and he's not very, you know what I mean? He's very dismissive, or it's just it's just weird. But people dig it, and they like it, and that's that's his thing, and yeah. that's cool. I'm just kind of the opposite. I'm, I'm more or less, let's all have fun with it, and I get it. And, you know, this is all, I'm thankful and grateful for all of you guys, you know, being fans, and this is crazy. Because there's a, there's a ton of actors that come to this town, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of movies that get made that were like Amir's and they're never seen. So to have a movie for whatever reason, Samurai Cop, be where it is and to be in that world, you know, like I said, even in my nine to five, it really starts crossing over. People recognize me and it's just weird. But you know what I mean? To, to, to have something, just one movie is great. Now all of a sudden two you know, it's not something to shit on. So that's why I said I do appreciate Amir and I do appreciate Greg because there's at least something I've done out there. It's not the best that I've ever done, but it's something that is it, what I always wanted to, which was to be entertaining. And I love comedy. I didn't know it would manifest itself in that way, but you know, it is what it is. But so Tommy, I just, I don't know. I just think um, it, it, it was fun to work with him, but we really didn't have that many intimate conversations or to get to know the guy, but uh, I, I, he was worth every penny. He delivered 
exactly what Greg spent a lot of money, <laughs> you know, getting Tommy in the movie. There was a big portion of that budget went towards Tommy and his ego and to get him in that. But Greg, I think, knew the value as a filmmaker having Tommy and I together in a scene, like I've likened it to Heat with Pacino and De Niro, you know, <laughs> yeah. here's the two icons of horrible movie, but don't ever tell Tommy that. I mean, I even said that at the first dinner. I said, people just want to see us together, man. You know, it's like the two bad actors. He goes, I am not the bad actor. <laughs> <laughs> this comes oh, from the guy that looked like a drunk hamburger in the fucking movie. <laughs> well, yeah, that was my comedic you know observation but i get it and that was rude i guess i shouldn't have I, some people you know you you got to respect their their sense of reality and um but you know for greg to have those two together on on screen you know that works out i just said people want to see jordan and and uh you know uh kobe playing against each other you know this just yeah. the, the people i think they'll they'll enjoy it but so i think those scenes there's actually in one scene in the final um cut that greg did where i'm i almost start laughing because everyone's cracking up because greg is feeding those lines to tommy he's repeating them as we're spinning round and round and i'm getting dizzy oh, and i'm shit. trying not to laugh and greg is just throwing out random quotes from memorable food movies that i don't know about you know he's doing <laughs> cassavetti lines from this and that <laughs> you know i don't get that but that's greg's and that's why I said I wish you would speak more to this because you have more knowledge. But Greg's a connoisseur of old movies and Hitchcock, all kinds of yeah. niche things that Greg was giving to Tommy to, uh, you know, spew out, which were, which was funny. Well, I'm glad that you were talking about Tommy and how he was slightly difficult to work with because as somebody who's seen the Disaster Artist and also have read the book, I'm well aware of how he is backstage and just hearing somebody actually speak up about that very uh respectable but i do have a question for you okay so tommy wiseau was in samurai cop 2 would you be in the room 2 if that were to ever become a thing i think i would because i would understand the context in which that they he would have me there mm -hmm. you know what i mean and and then i would you know what i mean so i i don't know if Tommy didn't understand why he was, I mean, no one was knocking down the guy's door, number one. He, right. he had done the room and, and that was it. And I'm not yeah. trying to be, I'm just saying he had a great money making thing, you know, his midnight screenings and that's his thing. But, um, so for Greg to give him the opportunity to be in a movie that, that had, you know, at least some buzz behind it was kind of good. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I would mind doing that i mean now i'm just really picky i just think you know maybe people have seen enough of me <laughs> no man. oh not enough no, but, no. you know what i mean it, i i think it would really depend on what what it is but yeah i have no problem i just i just wish tommy would be a little bit more um i just think he he is disrespectful to to fans and like i've said before with the comedy i think the fans are the power i think they're the ones especially cult fans it's a certain type of intelligence and and um, you vibrate a little higher level than your average movie goer. Obviously, any average movie guy sits down in front of Samurai Cop and goes, "This is fucking stupid. I'm out of here." It takes a certain type of, I don't know, something to to get art, to get filmmaking, to get the quirkiness, to to, to really delve in and say, "This is fucking hilarious," and you got to see it. And then people, you know, see the movie fun for what it is and not at its surface but delve deep into the subtext of that whole thing but i just don't think tommy you know he's he's into that and and it's just sad that that he he does pull um his weight around now there was a documentary when i was over in madrid spain i was invited after samurai cop 2 was finished i went there for a film festival and they screened a movie there called a room full of spoons and i don't know if you guys have heard about this documentary oh, yeah. it was so that seemed to be a different perspective and gave somebody a little bit more backstory about Tommy, which he immediately went to court and tried to squash and try. So I'm thinking, why, why do you go to such severity? It is what it is. You know, where your money came from. I know you like that mystery where you're originally born. I mean, they met his family and talked. So I don't know why it's such a big secret. You know what I mean? It's just kind of, yeah. especially in this day and age, you can Google and find out anything about anybody and that's kind of what the filmmaker did he went to the la courthouse that he pulled out all of the uh court filings and you can see if you want to personally delve into the you know the theft and the money the check right you know there's a lot of gray criminal shit that's there that kind of surrounds where his money comes from but it's not so i don't know if he's trying to keep people away from that 
Um, you know, it is what it is. That's kind of why I spoke about my dark past and things that I did and stupid choices I made in between Samurai Cop and Samurai Cop 2. Because it's just who I was and I did dumb things and hung around the wrong people and went and did time. And that that's in, in, in itself a story. But it's who I am and, you know, I'm not going to hide from it. It's no. just like, yeah, I'll speak candidly about it and that's what it was. But Tommy's just a different... Um, a different I don't think he would ever ask me to be in a, in a sequel of his movie. I just think he feels... You know, intimidated or somewhat threatened. <laughs> I don't. You know what I mean. I just got kind of got that vibe from him, even on our film. Even though I very tried to make him feel extremely comfortable and make him, you know, not feel that way, just because we were happy to have him. But it's just just two different personality types, I guess. Yeah, I actually have a question. Uh, speaking of when Devin, you brought the disaster artist up, mm-hmm. uh, Matt. What do you think? Like, I'm trying to think about how to word this. Other, um, if they were to make, if somebody were to make a film based on the making of Samurai Cop, kind of how the disaster artist was based on the room. Like, what would you think of something like that? Do you think that that would be an interesting story to put on film for a wider audience? I don't think so. I don't think it has the, the, the novelty that Tommy's did because that, that I really like the disaster artist as that underdog story. Here comes a guy, you know, that's from another country, doesn't speak English and there's no fucking way he's ever going to work ever. Every, no one's going to hire him. There's just, you know what I mean? There's a lot of guys that come out and think, oh, I'm a great actor, like I did. Or there's <laughs> comics that think, I'm funny, and, and you really find out you're really not. But they believe it. So Tommy, there was just no chance in hell he was ever going to make, because he just didn't have what, you know, it it, 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 it would take to make it in this town. Um, so... For him to say, fuck it, I'm going to take my own money and I'll make my own movie. And then to just go out and do it, you know, that in and of itself is is, is drive and, and passion and that's great. And then what better way to do that? It kind of likens what I was talking about. He had control. I would love to have had the ability to do that and put together a film and put it out there. I, I would think that mine would be better. Maybe I'm the same as Tommy. You, dude, you suck. What the fuck are you thinking? You just never know. But you know what I mean? I'm trying to be really, you know, talk straight but the the novelty was that he finished it he completed it it was absurd that the, the dollar amount involved so on and so forth then it gets released and then it finds that audience of people just mocking it laughing it that obviously had to crush him but then he realized well you know i don't know there's some money here or at least people are coming so that becomes a different type of success so yeah that you know is, is great but it's a different it's a, it's a kind of success that none of us would have imagined for him and because we certainly wouldn't have imagined him having success doing the, the, the straight and narrow acting road. It's just, it just wouldn't have worked for him. Now, Von Damme, Van Damme with his accent, it worked because he had a skill. He had something that was unique. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Arnold, same thing, the bodybuilder that, then you go past that, 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 um, you know, the, the not having a, a strong capacity of, you know, for the English language, kind of like me right now. But <laughs> he, he found his own niche, and that's why I said that's a miracle, and that is a story of itself. Our story for Samurai Cop, I just don't think there's there's anything there that's that's interesting because there were a ton of movies like that that were made, even the other Amir movies, that they, they just didn't have... I don't know if it was Mark and I together or something that made our movie a little different than the previous four that Amir did. Cause you, we talked about it earlier. There is a similarity in all the movies, just maybe the talent or something of the casting was just not right. But for some reason, when Samurai Cop came, Amir got it lucky. He got that lightning in a bottle with all of the casting and all of the, you know what I mean? The visuals, cause every scene in that movie of Samurai Cop is interesting. I don't have to be in it. Mark doesn't. It could be the bit players. It could be you saw this, you saw that. So that's what makes that. And I don't know how you make a documentary or you know a, a making of it, something like that. Yeah. Um, I think you could do a really good, well done version of kind of what I do is explaining the movie, sit down, maybe revisit locations just for fans to say, oh, this is cool to see, you know, really where they were at. Matt talks about this scene, that scene. I don't know if that would be interesting, but I don't think you could ever do like like. Um, like uh, Franco did with, with, you know, Samurai Cop. Yeah. Okay, so this is completely out of left field, but we've been joking all night about the banana thing. How, <laughs> how would you feel if I legitimately, like, 
had a shirt of your face photoshopped on a banana and sent it to you? Just for me to keep? I get. Yeah. I mean, I get fans sending me all kinds of stuff. I, I mean, I speak about my looks. I get it. Um, obviously, <laughs> you know, in my 20s and 30s, uh, you know, there's a vanity and there's a narcissism and I, I like to look the best. But as you get older, it just is what it is. I've been in tanning beds my whole life. So when Greg shot that movie on high def 6K resolution, I, I see myself, I don't, I don't have great vision. I wear, you know, prescriptive lenses. So when I look at a mirror, that's probably a mirror, like a mirror, like a reflective mirror, not a mirror, Siobhan. Ah. Um, you know, three feet away, I don't see the creaks and crevices and cracks and blah blah so to see it up on the screen just like holy shit (laughs) and from day one i said i don't want makeup i don't need makeup i'm fine (laughs) come on we don't and then i realized jesus christ sun damage this that i'm just like holy fuck so you just gotta laugh as my body obviously i never took steroids or did any type of um, muscle enhancement everything you see of me during samurai cop i was 235 was just from diet exercise that's it, you know, and I had wow. just come down from 270 to about 230, 235 when we filmed Samurai Cop. When I filmed Samurai Cop 2, I was probably 180. I don't know why, as I keep getting older, you know, you lose your muscle mass. Now, yeah. you can take HGH like Sly and Arnold and all the guys that, in Hollywood that do it, but I just think, I don't want to look like that. Sly, to me, looks like now the Italian version of Shrek. and i don't i i'm not trying to be a dick i'm just saying something goes on with that hgh and they said there are side effects where it's like gigantism his nose is bigger his head is bigger his hands are bigger his testosterone has made his testicle smaller but yeah you know it's just yeah i mean that's why i said the the shrek reference because things just aren't there so i just keep withering away and the more i get older the prunier so that's why i insisted that if we do do a third movie it's got to be shot on 35 mil and i'm going to filter the shit out of it like I'm Marcus <laughs> or you know uh warren Beatty and bugsy i'm going to box light everything because i just said dude i can't look at myself and i said i don't think people want to see me you know <laughs> looking like that you're such a great Even, sport though but i mean it is what it is you know you get old van damme looks like fucking ridiculousness i mean at his age something he oh, aged really God. bad but i mean he lived the hard life of drugging and drinking and you know, I didn't do any of that stuff. It's yeah. just me getting older, and that's just the ego and the vanity. So you got to be able to look at yourself and go, dude, you're a fucked up version of Nicolas Cage. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, so you got to embrace it because otherwise you're just going to be not the base. But, you know, I'm, fine. I'm fine looking in the mirror, and I, I said I don't mind it, but I get it if people you know pick out, especially your generation. You know, you guys are like almost my youngest daughter's age. I think you're a little older, so I get it. And yeah, it's I'm just 21. Fun. Yes, but yeah, she's she's turning. I think she just graduates in a month or so. But oh wow! So anyway, it's just funny to uh, to see it. And I get it, self deprecation, and that's part of why my stand up comedy was the same manner. It's like I'm still that doofy kid from grade school with the high water pants, the buck teeth, um, you know, the bowl haircut from Dumb and Dumber. Oof. And so I never I never left that part of me. I, you know, a kid from Portland, Oregon. Obviously, I started weight training in high school, and then I got up to this big, giant, 270-pound WWF body. And maybe that allowed me now not to be picked on or made fun of because people thought, well, I don't want to fuck with that guy. But I was still the nice, kind guy, and I really went out of my way, kind of like Dwayne The Rock Johnson is. He's just mm-hmm. very kind, giant, but the guy could fucking squash you if he wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that comes from a sense of where you came from and where you're at, and and like I said, I, I just think so. It's fun. I don't <laughs> I don't mind it. I've laughed, like I said, watching reviews and listening to people make comments about holy shit, you know this guy. And I laugh because it's true, and I think that's what what helps to be able to just be you know honest and you know enjoy it with everybody else because it is what it is. Yeah, All right. We really we really thought it was cool that you you had gone and checked out both of the, the podcasts that we had done on your films too. I was like, cause I, I'll never forget. I, I told Cody, I was like, I, think, I said, you fucking listen to him, man. And then Devin, you were just like, Oh fuck. <laughs> yeah. Like I was no. blown to shit. Like I didn't, I wasn't expecting this. I'm just some punk kid who works at the dollar store and told my best friend, Hey, I found this movie called Samurai cop. You should definitely watch it. Like we need to get together. It, I thought it was just a throwaway thing. Next thing I know, I'm talking to the actual star of the movie, and as a 21-year-old kid, this is like a big deal for me. 
it's a big deal for all three of us, honestly. Yeah, and that's awesome. But that that to me is what because people ask. You know, I'm glad you guys enjoy the movie. But what I enjoy is, like I said, talking with people to find out where did you find the movie? When did you first come about it? Because people come up to me on the street and they go, "Oh my God, are you Samurai Cop?" And they look to me to be, you know, your guys' age. And they go, oh, "When I was a kid, we loved this." I go, "Kid, where the fuck where did you see this?" <laughs> you know. And then that's what I enjoy are the stories or the people's reviewing of the movie. And you know, YouTube's just chock full of people's interviews and and you know, little yeah. blogs and blogs. And I just I think it's fun and I think it's a great community of. Hell yeah. people but yeah that's i like hearing people's stories and, and then like i said they're just oh can i get a picture and it's like you know, like the, up, the show i got coming up here in my nine to five job the e3 expo here in oh, la what? it's, it's, it's awesome. a gaming gaming expo but i yep. can't even walk the show floor when that thing opens because people same at comic-con they're like samurai Con, <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sitting there with guys i work with and they're like what the fuck is going on because they know me as matt Curry, but they all know now because of yeah. the sequel three years ago but so it's just funny that, you know, if you ask the average person, I guess, nobody has any idea walking the streets. But in certain genres, you know, that it's just, you, I just, it just amazes me that many people have seen the movie and enjoy it. And like I said, it's around the world. I, I constantly have people reaching out from Europe and, and, you know, Spain and especially the UK. But even here in town, like I said, since the sequel, for me to go into Whole Foods and shop or Trader Joe's and have the guy checking me out go, I think I know you. And it's like, oh, yeah, where do you know me from? Are you Samurai Cop? And it's like, oh, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> three, or four, three or four years ago, never did this ever come up. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah. just, it's just weird. I don't know why. That Maybe it just keeps growing and growing, which would be great. Uh, obviously, when we have the video game come out, I think next year that'll be fun because it's an, a retro style, you know, Sega type video game as if samurai cop was made back in the 90s so that was a fun thing that a fan approached me and they developed and then maybe leading to filming the sequel in 2019 and released in 2020 on the 30 year anniversary would be the natural progression if in fact more and more people start hearing about and 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 thinking oh this is funny and we saw the sequel and now they want to do a third and you know i mean that's it's just for some reason it keeps growing out there in in the uh you know, word of mouth and spreading around where yeah. it's affecting my little bubble, my little world of, and, you know, like I said, where I shop. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's, that's why like Cody and I do this. And then we have, you know, friends of ours come on the show like Devin, you know, because when, when we have stuff like this, that comes into our lives, like, you know, movies or just anything entertainment based, we, we want to get it out there for more people to listen to, especially stuff like this, because like, you know, that's brand new news to us as far as like the video game thing. That's really cool news to hear. And then because, you know, we keep we kept joking it's like, man, damn, we want Samurai Cop 3 and you we fucking want Samurai Cop 3 would be fucking awesome. Um, In space. Yes. Yeah, no shit, right? <laughs> but, but what I was going to ask, um, you know, obviously the video game thing, but also with because uh, Greg was telling me that he is targeting he's trying to target December for Enter the Samurai to come out. Do you think like because. This generation has, um, they're so enthralled by documentary films in general nowadays. Do you think that the documentary itself could maybe attract an uh, an audience that had never heard of the franchise beforehand and maybe think, oh, this is kind of cool, and then do some research and then garner more interest for a third film? Um, that's where Greg and I, as producers kind of differed in the point of view. I think Greg wanted it to more be the making of Samurai Cop 2. And I said, I think we should take it and basically if you would use the beginning part of the documentary to explain the movie and how it became this phenomenon. And then, you know, really kind of delve into that so that like you just spoke about, the average person, it's an interesting story. You know, here's a cult movie called Samurai Cop and here's the blah, 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 blah. And then here's the bridge the guy they thought was a star was dead then he came back to life and then we we made this second movie so you know you can kind of go into that and explain but i think if you make it an overall documentary about samurai cop you know what it was and then where we were and then the sequel and then to show the problems that that arose which i think we've got tons of footage i think and again i i haven't been privy because greg's keeping me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> keeping me away from <laughs> oh god dude from because we have two different points of view. you know what i mean you can't have two directors or two editors everybody's gonna have right. a different point of view but i said i think that's the angle that that would be most 
lucrative for the franchise, if you want to call it that, to like you just spoke about, leading into interest in doing a third. Let people see the, the natural progression of the first movie. Then you did the second. It, it kind of fell because of certain problems below the mark we were looking for. But we really wanted to make third times the charm. And, you know, Matt's going to be really creatively in control. I have a certain budget. Uh, you know, that's set, and I have investors that really want to make the movie. There is $4 million right now to do it. My hesitation is the same as it was for Greg, is unless you're a trust fund baby and have $4 million to just piss away, it's really hard for me to have somebody put up money for something that maybe will not even make one-tenth of 1% back. Yeah. So it's like, I feel kind of bad. And what would we really be making that third one for? Is it for my ego to say, oh, look, finally we got it right? Is that is that disrespectful to the first two people? Um, is it just for my own ego? And so Mark and I can say, look, you know, here's... I, I just think I wanted to make, and I think you've seen on my tweets kind of what we wanted to do, but <clears throat> unless it's 100% crowdfunded, then you have no problem with risk and reward because there is no risk now because the money was put up by hundreds of fans or thousands of fans. Yeah. And if it doesn't make a dime, it doesn't matter because whoever contributed 10 bucks is the, you know, they're going to get the movie. You can put it out in a theater and if it does well and it stands alone, great. If it's got a little backstory and people say, well, that was interesting, but where did it come from? Or, oh, there's a second one and the first one. Let's go watch that. That's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm being pulled. I don't really care if we ever make a third one, but I just think if we're going to do it, it's got to be done right. And I'm really a stickler about music and films. I think it really controls moods and moments and beats and, and things that were missing in the second movie. Um, and, you know, that costs money to license some of the music that I really want to use that I think when people watch it, it's, you know, a, an old throwback to a 90s style that would appeal to, um, you know, it could probably do a small theatrical release. But even if it went to video, as long as someone can profit from it, because it is show business and it's not just... Of waste your fucking money yeah of course. um so that's that's the dilemma and that's that's where it's tough to, to see what what you could do the video game itself i understood and and i likened the idea behind that because i guess retro video games are kind of popular right now and yeah, it's yeah. coming back again and, and the way that we talked about the left to right movement the nine different levels and samurai fights the just plethora of the bad guy characters you know from the first movie the you know the jerry curled big black guy you know it's just <laughs> funny the helicopter flying in and and she gives him some power when he's got a wig on he's got extra power here comes mark from the left <laughs> side of the screen this just spinning so wildly firing a gun with bug eyes you know i mean i said that's gets funny more help if, with that's eating bananas. <laughs> <laughs> if that's entertaining you know, the guy's like, oh, people would love it. You know, again, the download's, what, nine bucks? Okay, yeah, whatever, people. But maybe use that money to, to parlay it. Or, and like I said, there's a huge crossover of gamers that follow Samurai Cop, and so there's a crossover between the two. You got three of them know. right here. Yep. Yeah. I well, yeah, pay... I, I, you know, me being the old fart, you know, I, didn't, I, I don't understand <laughs> gaming and all that, but I get it because I work in, like I said, the industry. We put on the trade shows for BlizzCon and, and uh, you know, all these kind of like E3 and these, so I see that there's just tons and tons of dough that's made and, and kids love it. But, um, so yeah, there's, you know, if, if the video game can kind of spark interest, keep the ball rolling, Greg's documentary comes out in December. Hopefully, you know, uh, it's from the point of view, like I said, please show it from the, from the point of view of, and it's hard for him to do, but you know, how, how amazing it is what you achieved. And it's only going to come forth if I can speak, on a voiceover to give you the kudos because I know you won't say it and no one really wants to say, Oh, here's Matt on day one behind the scenes, looking in the mirror. Every... That's funny. <laughs> and they'll say, Oh, that was hilarious. And Oh, the guy gets arrested on set. Oh, that's funny. But it's like, really, let's tell a story. Let's make the samurai cop. And, and that's where we have a, a lot of creative differences, but hopefully, I don't know. I mean, I hope Greg can, can pull it off. And I know, again, he's got to put up money to get that done. You know, it's not cheap just to do all that kind of stuff. You got to pay an editor. You got to, you know, maybe if you want to shoot some additional scenes, you know, interviews that cost money, this and that, but. And I, and I, and I think that's where our role as, you know, reviewers, podcasters, developers of games and so forth come as an important role in this because we carry that spark, that fire, to get Greg where he needs to be to make the documentary and then eventually, hopefully, 
get more crowdfunding for you know the third film for y'all to come back and make like like you said the third time's a charm film so that way we can have like that ultimate like joe marshall that we've always been wanting in space you know kind of thing (laughs) so yeah it comes it comes from our shoulders now to like carry y'all on you know to the future with samurai cop 3 basically or whatever we want to call it at this point now more than ever basically yeah, and I think that's part of the reason when I, like I said, there's tons of guys that approach and want to do interviews and this and that, but when I heard you guys, you guys are, are, are it's, it's a different level of, of um, you guys get it, and you're really good at what you guys do, and you, you hit the points, and I think hopefully you have that big audience that really appreciate good good talent and good interviewing, uh, because it does make a difference, and I, that's why I said I liked everything that your point of views, and you guys really got it, and that's what kind of made me think. You know what? I'd love to talk, you know, to these guys just because they're passionate about it, and they're really good at what they do. You guys have great personalities, good voices, and it's interesting to listen to you. That's the worst thing you could be is be un- 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 uninteresting. So, uh, you know, you guys hit that mark. If you could but, only see the grins on her faces right now, yeah, <laughs> that really, well, no, means, appreciate- it really means a lot, though. <laughs> Seriously, that means a lot. I, uh, I appreciate that. Like I said, that's always been been weird for me. Even like I said, I'm walking even at E3. I think two years ago, the people that come up and they 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 they're shaking, which to me, I'm just math and fucking you know jabroni, <laughs> <laughs> jabroni. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, but it's just funny, and it's like, no, calm down. You know, the girls are. Can I get a pic? You know, and they're just. It's just because they see it's him. It's the samurai cop. So to me, that's just so hilarious, and it's humbling. But it's like, no, I'm just the average dumb fuck. Really, I'm just, that's just funny. I get it. A Joe Brony, even. It's yeah. just, a, it's a Joe Oh, hi, Joe. <laughs> so that's a, that's a fun and, and hard thing for me to, to deal with, you know. I mean, I never really wanted to be famous. I always said I wish I could make the money that you make when you're famous, but not be famous, because I'm really a private, you know, I'm not looking to have people. And this is probably the best degree of fame. It's like not really known, but kind of, you know what I mean? You I don't, that get, little mid- I don't like have to whisper worry about in the wind, basically. <laughs> yeah. Paparazzi following me around. I'd be Sean Penn, believe me. I'd be like, you fucking cocksucker, get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bad, bad, bad temper for fame. But, I'll you cut your I mean. arm off, dude. <laughs> yeah, I've done it before. Slice your, slice your arm off. <laughs> <laughs> and that was another thing you guys made a funny reference for my buddy. That guy, Tom Gleason, is a good friend of mine. He also worked as a bodyguard uh, for Stallone, too, with me. We both actually started the same day. So when I approached him, I go, Tom, we're doing the sequel. And he's like, you got to be kidding. I go, I want you to be in it. And I go, we got to come up with something. And so he came up with this idea and he put his fucking hand in two double rubber gloves. and goes, <laughs> It's a prosthetic arm. It'll be funny. And I go, this is fucking hilarious. I mean, I was just cracking up the whole day when I saw him. And then he's lifting his arm to salute. So we all had, <laughs> that was we had fucking with gold. It. That was fucking yeah, gold. <laughs> those are the little gems. And, and then for him to still have the same exact shirt that he wore that day. <laughs> Again, just like gold. You know, th- those were the things that if they're really the true fans are out there, will realize the suit that I wear in when I take off my thing and I go fight the bad guys in two is the same suit I wore when I took her to church or met her at church. So we did little things like that, having yep. the prelude in the same fucking movie again that was in the first movie. Um, you know, just little... Things like that. The lion head was a little ridiculous. Greg put it in almost every scene, but um, so you know what I mean. That's 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 where you want to have fun with the fans and, and really do it. But I just don't know if there's that many, you know, fans around the world that would be able to crowdfund. Because I even hate doing that. I'm a nine to five guy. I'm a union guy. I make. I know I'm at the value of a dollar, and I think you know, I don't know. I could say if you had a hundred thousand fans and they each paid you know, 10 bucks contributed. I don't know, somebody do the math. Okay, that starts to add up and that's fine. But is there 100,000 people out there? It seems like you'd think that because it's so known, but I don't know. I, you know, people say, I, I didn't even know you guys did a Kickstarter for the second one. Um, so you know what I mean? It's it's kind of like a weird, are we making a movie for what, 50 guys, 50 girls? Are we making it for a bigger audience? Should we do it where we don't reference the first two, but throw some things um, in there for the fans that are expecting, you know, that's kind of what Greg did with the second one. Yeah, it's kind of funny. 
it's kind of funny because we make that joke like every other episode about how many people listen to our show. It's like, oh yeah, there's like 50 to 100 people. But like, oh yeah, you two people still listening to the show right now. <laughs> yeah. We appreciate both of y'all. Yeah, all yeah, two of you. you never know. But you have a great quality. You have a great product. And so eventually, yeah, if it gets out there, it, you know, you just never know. It's like anything. It just keeps growing and growing. But the fact that you guys have the passion and the ability to do it at a professional level that you guys are doing at at such a young age that's great and where it leads you know who knows but that's just kind of like we're all on these crazy journeys and it's just a fun little bubble that we all are in but uh i just like listening to you guys and even all your other ones when you start putting up more up i'll probably be listening but oh absolutely yeah this is going to be 20 uh this one will be episode 22 so like we we do it every week so like you're on the, yeah you're, we you're definitely get, on the train we're going to get more of them going out so yeah we got to get greg on i mean obviously he's not oh, going to be as ver- verbose and verbal diarrhea like me i can oh. sit here for two hours <laughs> but i mean i just think he's got a lot of input and I just wish he would kind of share some of the, and I don't know, maybe it'll come out in the documentary and, and we'll, we'll see it, but oh, dude, he's a great guy and he's, he'd be great if we could pin him down for, oh, I'm gonna. for an interview. Oh, I'm fucking gonna. Uh, Mark, Mark, no, yeah. seriously, dude, mark my words, I'm gonna get Greg on this fucking show. Yeah, especially if he can call in like I'm doing and he doesn't that's have to what, worry about. But. That's what I plan on doing, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and speaking of call in, uh, no, probably maybe wrap this up here soon but speaking of calling in when you first pitched uh you know doing this with us and you were like oh skype this that the other dude dude, like seriously the thought ran through my mind i was like if matthew caritas fucking calls me on skype with a voice uh, i mean a voice with a video i was like i'm gonna fucking put a chair and a lamp in front of the fucking webcam just to mess with him (laughs) like just just to see like i could just picture it now it's like boop calls in boop Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, just what the fuck? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought, like, if that would have happened, I, you seemed, like, so cool. Like, just, you know, the back and forth, me, you and I have been, you know, speaking on Twitter. I was like, he's he probably would crack up at that. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I wouldn't. Like I said, most of the time, some people, they I, the reason I said Skype, because I think they said the sound quality sometimes comes better. It across, does. Um, but I don't know cell phone wise how this sounds because you don't want to sound like you're in a fucking toilet talk. Because you can't hear the, the guest. And, you sound like you're on no, an airplane. I mean, it's like, welcome, passengers. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, like this, it sounds good on Arnia, but like, you know, like we tried with the with the whole Skype thing and like I was even telling Greg or whatever, I said, man, the damn, um, the damn internet speed on the computer was just like ass. Like, because I tried to test a call with a friend of mine this past week and I was just like, yeah, no, this is not happening. So, I was like, well, there goes my fucking chair and lamp uh, thing. So. <laughs> so, Yeah, plus you guys are on a different... Where are you guys uh, calling from? Is it... Um, Louisiana. 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 Okay, so you're two hours, two hours. I mm-hmm. think, ahead. Yeah, which I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm kind of a night owl, but... Oh, we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll stay all up right. till like 4 a.m. It's all good. <laughs> all right. But That's yeah, man, awesome. when... Um, when the uh, documentary comes out, I mean, if you want to, like, we'd love to have you back on, like, you know, when the documentary comes out or something, like, try to get. Yeah, you I'll give you my observations too. Yeah, I just don't know how Greg's releasing it or what he's gonna do. As far, I don't know, you know, I don't know if he's gonna have it available on if it's Amazon or if you, I, I mean, just, I don't know. I just hate keeping, you know what I mean, having people pay for. Thing. Like I said, don't make people pay for the, you know, the Blu-ray. But it's like, dude, I'm here to make money. I said, yeah, I get it, but. Yeah, I just feel I feel like we're not giving them what they wanted, and but there are people that really enjoy it. Like I said, I think over time, you, when you watch Greg's movie, there's so many weird things with that thing that it's just like, oh my god, this is, you know, and that's why I think Greg should speak more why he did certain scenes, and um, you know, like you guys made points when Mark's firing and shooting at somebody, the guy just jumps out and dies. <laughs> <laughs> that and shit I, was great. I just think it's Greg, he told them to do that. You know, I wasn't there on every day shooting, but I know he just thought things would be funny and, and to do, you know, certain things that would come across as, as you know, that the fans would like. But, you know, when, uh, some of this stuff is just like way out, man. Oh, yeah. But uh, for sure, man, that we've had a blast talking with you, man. We really appreciate you coming on doing Definitely. this. One. No, I appreciate yeah. you guys having me. And, and like I said, good review got my attention. And I'm glad to at least hopefully corrected any or brought up some things that were you didn't know before that maybe are interesting now oh, not absolutely. to you and mm-hmm. to the listeners yeah oh for sure and uh, i know they're gonna get a kick out of this because uh, a lot of we've got a lot of feedback they they really enjoyed the two particular episodes that we we covered the movies on so this hopefully will give them you know some more insight that maybe they didn't know so right that's awesome
awesome. Yeah, and uh, for those people that are listening out there, Matt, can you tell them what katana means? <laughs> Katana means a Japanese sword. That's right. <laughs> you, you son of a bitches, it's Japanese sword. <laughs> yes. It was such a plain line that Amir had written. And I, he went, they just asked, what does katana mean? And he goes, just say it. It means Japanese sword. It's just like such random. But it's funny how people pick out certain dialogue things that I would have, it would have just been a throwaway line to me. But like I said, the captain of that movie who stole the show, as far as I'm concerned, to play Captain Roma, that actor was hilarious. Police chief. Oh my um, god, the club up his ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just funny to see him, the poor guy, and he was a professional actor, like I said, to to just say your lines and then to stall and to wait and to pause, waiting for a mirror to say cut, and the mirror wouldn't because the roll of film was almost out, and he didn't want to waste it, so he just let the camera keep rolling. You know what I mean? It's just like weird stuff like that. It's just. <laughs> That's oh, funny stuff. Fucking God. gold comedy. And I don't know if you guys noticed, and I think I talked about it in the, uh, the I think the commentary that Greg did of Samurai Cop 1. There's a frame where you do see a mirror in a cameo on the side of the freeway. I don't know if you guys have ever stopped or slowed down on a Blu-ray. When we're doing that stupid van chase in the opening sequence, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a part where the van is driving down a freeway. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a left to right panning shot, and at the very end of the shot, you'll see a man standing there looking out over the freeway, and that was a mirror. Oh shit! <laughs> um, waiting to you know see you know when they drove by, so he could tell Peter, the cameraman, to stop filming. But that was kind of little things like that that I like to point out. That I when I see things like that in the opening sequence, the very first scene where um, Mustache Man, I think you guys call him, comes out. <laughs> um, <laughs> And if you see in the background, there's a tennis court and there's two people. That's me and the uh, Janice rehearsing that's, that nobody knows. But, you know, what I mean, those little things like that that pop up. Um, and in the Blue Lagoon restaurant, there's a part where there's a close up of Robert Zadar yeah. giving a reaction shot. And I come mm-hmm. zipping down the stairs of that Carlos and Charlie staircase <laughs> outside and forget, oops, they're still filming. And I duck back out of frame. <laughs> 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 sitting in front of a live audience and we're screening it that we'll we'll point out and freeze frame but um yeah i mean i can get micro if people want to start that's dissecting awesome. that film <laughs> it's but uh it's just a fun thing and like i said i appreciate you guys loving it being fans and, and and bringing it to more and more people out there through um through you know podcasts and your show oh yeah man that's definitely the goal here we plan on doing more shit like this you know on different films and everything else we can get our fucking hands on so mm-hmm. <laughs> we really appreciate you coming on to do this with us it was a lot of fun absolutely my pleasure and i'm sure someday we'll meet face to face either here in la or if i'm out traveling around oh absolutely That'd be well, wonderful. dude you've got yeah. our um you've got our information contact information just you know hit us up anytime you're down here in louisiana and you want to fucking eat some good cajun shit we'll <laughs> i know i've heard oh well, yeah. yeah we'll show you around dude that's awesome. All right, brother. Well, shoot. Uh, you have a great Memorial Day, and um, hopefully we'll holler at you again sometime. All right. You guys too, man. All right. Bye, Matt. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was Samurai Cop. One or two? Both. Both! And the future one. Dun dun dun! No shit. Guys, look, okay. We've got we got news of a fucking video game. We got news of there being a seven figure like budget kind of set in place for the third one. For the love of everything, we hope this happens. Please listen to this, share this with your friends, and let them fucking know what they are missing out on with this franchise. And take a leap forward with us and actually help promote it even further by contributing to the movie as well, too. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to donate if they get a Kickstarter or something. Yeah, if there's any type of Kickstarter, you're going to hear it here first or I say first, you're going to hear it here from us for sure. Hear it, see it, believe it. Absolutely. So it was so much fun talking with Matthew. I know we we all had obviously as you just heard, we had a fucking blast and a half talking to the guy, lots of laughs. Oh yeah, he was hilarious as shit. Such a good sport <laughs> yes. with the banana though. Dude, I'm so happy right now. Like this is an actual thing. Just like, how did you feel whenever he called you out on that about powerbombing your ass? Shook. Yeah. I was shook. 
Yeah. Yeah. You can power bomb splat everywhere. Man. I know. <laughs> Banana appeal. <laughs> I'm five foot two, okay? You gotta be gentle with me. So he's splat Kuretis? <laughs> That's right. Splat you, Kuretis. <laughs> so... If you guys want to help get Samurai Cop 3 off of the ground, here are some ways to help. And into space. Into space, absolutely. Samurai Cop 3, in space. Although I still think it should be Samurai Cop Marshall's Law. Joe Marshall's <laughs> Law. God damn it. So here's some ways that you guys can help out. First off, um, if you want to follow Matt online, he is on Twitter at mcaritas. So go follow him because he's pretty goddamn funny. Uh, second off, Go support the guys at Cinema Epic or Epoch. However, you know, either I've way. heard it pronounced both ways. But They're epic either way. You know, fucking shit. So if you guys will look in the show notes below our, you know, lovely podcast that you're listening to, go in the show notes. There will be links to their entire Amazon Prime library of all their films, including Samurai Cop 1 and 2. Fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will also include in the show notes direct links to the Blu-ray of Samurai Cop and the Blu-ray of Deadly Vengeance. It's so weird not seeing your mouth when you talk. I kind of like it this way. <laughs> because I could be sticking my tongue out at you and you wouldn't fucking know. Fuck you. <laughs> 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 I love it. You just you wouldn't fucking know. And Cody's all like, you got to know. Shout out to Ryan. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> God, that is pretty fucking disgusting. It is. <laughs> right in, right in your ear hole. <laughs> Ugh. So, go follow them on... All their social media, you can go to cinemaepoch.com. You can follow these guys on Twitter at cinema underscore epoch. You can check out the Amazon Prime library we'll have listed in the show notes. Also, check the show notes for our social media, facebook.com slash supermedia bros. Yeah, don't forget about us. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> Twitter.com slash supermedia, supermedia underscore bros. Instagram.com slash supermedia bros podcast. Come look at our stupid pictures. God damn it. Do it. They're very beautiful pictures. No, they're stupid. Don't, don't fucking act like they're beautiful. They're stupid. Beautifully stupid. Okay, you're right. Stupidly beautiful. Yeah, they're they're well they're very well lit. They're just stupid. Stupid. Because we're lit. Stupid is Amen, as stupid does. Bitch. <laughs> Amen, brother Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you guys I don't know if you want to give this out, but shit, if you guys want to go follow Dollar Store Devin around. Oof. Where where can we find you at on social media, sir? Instagram at uh, D A Duh underscore Bruh 007. Like B R U H? Yeah. Duh. Duh Bruh 007. Yeah. Go follow this motherfucker and go like all of his stupid pictures. Ye. They're very stupid. I fucking love it. <laughs> God damn. And of course, you can find. You can find Okami and myself by looking at our Instagram and our links to our personal Instagrams are at the top of the page. Yeet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed. Uh, this was a lot of fun being our first technical, like, quote unquote, you know, catch of an interview, if you will put it that way. Right. And we had a lot of fun doing it, and hopefully one day we'll get some more people on here. Like I said before, I want to try to get Greg on here. And shout out to Gino McGehee. I want to get you on here too, motherfucker. You're a bad son of a bitch. Go In all the good ways. Absolutely. He was kind enough to feature us on ScaredStiffReviews.com, his horror Ooh. review website. So please go check him out over there at ScaredStiffReviews.com. I will put a link in the show notes to that as well. Holla. Holla at you boys. Yeet. 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 Yeet, you need yeet. To go, you need to go yeet some food. I bet. <laughs> we should go do that now, dude. I got donuts in the truck. Oh my god, fuck yeah, it's donut day. Yeah, yeah, I got like like a dozen donuts just sitting in the hot truck, it, just sitting there. But how old are they? Good enough. <laughs> All right, well, fuck it, let's go eat some donuts. No preservatives. No preservatives. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, let's go. Homegrown. Let's go eat them motherfuckers. Let's no, roll. That's the fungus that's grown on it. Homegrown. Ooh. Oh my god. Ac extra flavoring. What? <laughs> yeah. Extra flavoring? Yep. Oh my god. What kind of extra flavoring? Fungus. Fungus? That's the fun guys. The fun guys. Fun guys? Fun guys. Oh my god. Let's get the fuck out of here and go eat <laughs> these donuts because now I want sugar diabetes. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Woo! Peace out, fuck Diabetes. <laughs>